Machine here, and you're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. 20 minute video for two minutes worth of content. Gold. Right, this is going to be episode 60 of Counterpoints. And as the show obviously approaches old age and inevitable death and decay, I thought, what better theme to discuss than the death of the camaraderie of a group of people who were colleagues slash friends, all now spread to the four corners of the earth with only Moses. That's right, in the end, it's like that TV show Survivor that your culture loves uh, similar. Yeah. Where it's not always the best person who wins Survivor. It's usually the sneakiest little cunt who sort of like <laughs> made the best, you know, relationships with people, fucked over the right person at the right time, you know. Eventually, they usually <laughs> have to fuck over some of their friends, but in the end, they win, and therefore, that is all that matters in American culture. So, congratulations yeah. to Moses, the only person who's still doing all the events, you know. But, uh... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. You know. no. I mean, this is all you need to know now, Samuel, is this is how the fucking gall of the man. When we first knew Moses, you know, he was like an up and coming guy who was like, you know, he's willing to like tip his hat to the older guys and wear his stripes. True. On the last fucking episode of a show I did with him, he was trying to big up like Potter as the next sensation in fucking analysis or whatever and tell me no, she was no, like no, one no, of the no, no, rookies no, no. of the okay, year no. or something. That's some not shit. what happened at all. <laughs> okay, that's a <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> the award. The award was best newcomer, and I just said yeah. as an afterthought, I was like, I thought Potter did really good this year for the events that she was on. You threw out there Max Mellet because you pay the guy and because you upload Don't pay all these fucking Reddit articles and YouTube videos. <laughs> Not in money, at least. Hmm. <laughs> hey. hey. <laughs> well, so this is where the show's going to go. We just took a week. <laughs> yeah, dude, exactly. Exactly. right out the yeah. gate. We're already in it. Anyway, awesome, that's man. all That's all by the by, Jason. Because what I actually thought was, yeah, since we did that episode of By the Numbers, which was like the end of year one, and even though Richard's mm -hmm. premise for that was just like, just get Moses and Anders to also comment on all the news. And, you know, it's, in theory, it's supposed to be the normal premise of the show. I think what most people enjoyed the most about the show, actually, was the parts where we were telling, like, you know, funny stories about, like, each other behind the scenes or something that, like, Mad Anders has said that you can sort of repeat in public. That isn't all the stuff we have to keep under seek under wraps until eventually, you know, he murders a lot of people or something and then go, oh, shit, I probably should have said something all the time anyway. <laughs> Just wait for the Asi book. Just I know, wait. aside from all that, we actually, you know, we told, like, the PG stories of actually that aren't outrageous, obviously. And not, and you'll notice none of them included anything about women. So, you know, speculate on your own grounds there, guys. <laughs> so I thought it would be funny, or entertaining at least, to try a similar type of concept, right? But it doesn't have to just be about, like, stories or whatever, you know. We can also talk okay. about things like what the behind the scenes of the casting life is like, what it's actually like in terms of, like, rivalries and stuff. So I thought we would start here, right? Because as I was, as I was thinking, like, what would we talk about on the show? Like, what sorts of stories? A story actually came out about Yanko that I thought was perfect to frame this entire discussion, right? Because, mm -hmm. by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm going to assume people know the guests on this one. Samla used to be a CSGO caster before Moses, like, you know, had him kicked out the industry and that went to overwatch <laughs> you know jokes aside actually has a fucking sick contract in overwatch so pretty good right in the overwatch league yeah, yanko you obviously you know spent all that time pulling a moses on me displacing me from the industry <laughs> and then you know when once he was in prime position and he had it all he had the goal to look out across his domain and go it's not enough i want more and yeah. so as a result he then left when decided I mean, imagine, this is how big, you know how people's egos get built up when they get successful. He goes, you know what? I reckon I'll go and teach Cold Zero and Fur how to play Counter-Strike. And then after a while, they were like, nah, brah, we got it. And he's like, what? what? Why isn't everyone implementing all my ideas though? And they go, thing is, we actually won majors without you and I don't want to get up at eight in the morning. So <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, like we've had a team meeting and decided that fuck you. And also we're... I know. Because that's definitely like the thing that was the most important, as if I was giving people sleeping schedules. Of course. <laughs> well, that's the problem, though, Yanko. What you have learned, sadly, is like in the modern day, I mean, anyone well, who follows sports knows this. It's more about the narrative than the reality. And unfortunately, that is going to be the narrative that like you were tr too strict with them, right? No, yeah, it's not the only like bullshit that come, came up in recent days, Duncan, as you are uh, aware of yourself. Course. Indeed. Yes. Yes. Well, anyway, that's... That me. You, yeah, no, he, he did a good job there. This is, this is the old rapport we used to have on the desk, right? Which is, he's just reminded me, I forgot to actually say the story, which is that there was a story came out. This is what reminded me of why this would be a good episode, where some guy I've never heard of, who's some sort of like, I think a journalist within the Chinese scene, did a tweet where he said that someone called, I think it was called like Freestyle One 
or something yeah, like something that. Like like, that a person I've also a person yeah. I'm also not familiar with, so I don't actually know who the person they're talking about is. But whoever this person is was at an event when when Star Series first did one of those events that was like the I League partnership, and they first did one that was mm-hmm. in China in 2017. And when they did this event, Yanko was there for analysis or whatever. And I was this the one that um, Renegades won with NAF or Verse Pro? Is that the one they're yeah. referring to? Right, so it was this tournament. So people might vaguely remember that result, even though they probably don't remember the tournament that much, because it was like a week after Epicenter, if you remember, in 2017. So anyway, after this result, right, this guy tells this story, and it's all written in Mandarin initially, and then he like, well, Chinese, Mandarin's actually the spoken dialect, but whatever. And he he like translates it okay, all, then. and apparently, I know, listen, I've got- I was totally going to call you on that, dude, by the way. I was just waiting. Uh, you listen, caught, you caught yourself. One day you'll have to learn that language as well. So anyway, right, so <laughs> <laughs> you know the way the world's going. So, well- to be honest, actually, this story probably precludes any of us from ever actually working in China again. But Yanko, apparently, when he was on the bus coming back on the night, because another thing about these events is, like, unlike a lot of Western events, where sometimes you might have the hotel, like, within walking distance of the actual venue. I've noticed if they ever have events in Shanghai, which is, like, a massive place, you're always getting, like, bussed over to the other place. And they also, because yeah. because everything's in Chinese, they don't, like, trust that you'll find your own way there. So, actually, what's funny is we end up getting treated like players, where we have to wait till the end of the day. And, you know, is there a shuttle going back to the hotel? And then we all have to wait and then come in and then 99% of the time there's some player holding you up when he's wrecked. So anyway, Yanko's going home at the end of the day. And he's in China, remember? So he's probably jet lagged, like fucking, who knows what the conditions are like. And this guy just sits there on this bus. Doesn't it? It's not even that he's talking to Yanko. He's just literally overhearing, just eavesdropping like a little cunt. And as opposed to just going inside his own brain, like, this is awesome. I get to hear all the things that I'm not supposed to hear. And all I have to do is keep them a secret. No, of course, this guy because Yanko in his comments made comments like you know like basically sort of a mildly mildly yeah allegedly well exactly technically we can't know that Yanko ever did it but allegedly this version (laughs) of Yanko (laughs) said some sorts of things that were along the lines of like you know a bit disparaging about China like didn't like the food didn't like the hotel and then apparently did say at one point a a sentence along the lines of only two days and then I'm back to civilization (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah of course not that all all alleged and all uncorroborated I will say but I did think to myself if that had have been Yanko who had have said those things, that does sound similar to the sort of things that we do say when we're off camera sometimes. When, you know, you get triggered by... F- I mean, R- Richard's already publicised this many times. The thing that triggers me always is food, you know. If the food's just pure shit, I always go fucking mad at everyone. Some people, it's the hotel. Anders, for example, goes mad if, like, the hotel room's not very good or there's any noise whatsoever outside his lordship's room, you know. Everyone has their own... <laughs> sem- similar, if, in fact, 20-minute smoke breaks don't fit into... Five minute breaks before a television show goes live with no possibility to stop. <laughs> the, amount, the amount of times, uh, Moses, that I saw Sebler yeah. run past our analyst desk to the E League commentary desk, a show which cannot be delayed. Like, you can't oh, just throw like a, a Twitch screen up for like another 10 minutes. He's just running past when they like told him, like, yeah, live in two minutes. Like, it's just you, you have to take the elevator at E League. So, yes, you know, it was like, oh, I've got plenty of fucking time. And then he gets back to the elevator and it takes an extra five minutes to actually get to him and open up the door and he's like oh fuck i'm late for the show shit <laughs> no, anders anders always talked about that too because he was just like there were there were times where we've been at events and production will just go into his ear and they're like so where's similar and anders is just like don't don't worry he'll he'll be <laughs> i'll he'll be there exactly <laughs> moses that's the point of this story is that i've never been late i've never held him up i've gotten there like two seconds I before we go live throw the headset I on guarantee you there's been one or two times that you don't remember where you no 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 Nope. Can't remember a single time. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Maybe I don't remember, but I, that's I, the best, my head. That's, that's the best answer, Sam. I do not recall this. I do not recall exactly. ever <laughs> being late or I holding up the production in that way. I may or did these things you're talking about, but... Uh, I which is why, which is why that's the first thing you always say when you get to the venue and you're dealing with like the pro- the producer or like the manager or whatever, where you're just like, "Don't worry about me. I'll be where I need to be when you need me to be there." Right? Like, yeah, that is true. It and does then, happen. And, it does happen. and that's all that that's all that needs to happen. They need to just trust me to be responsible and professional and be where I need to be. But sometimes, you know, that gets out the of The worst thing is, with, with these like <laughs> tournament organizers, you've, you've been working for years, like ESL, for example. Mm-hmm. And like lately, it has been the same person being the talent manager. So it's easier, you know, you get to know the person, they know you. But when sure. they bring something new, I mean, of course, that person needs to do their job. And their job is to make sure you're in your place at the right time. But, you know, sometimes it just gets so annoying 
like it happens throughout the group stage and then you come to the playoffs and you you know you have a good game coming up you want to get in the zone you want to yeah. like do good work like you really want to hype the match up up uh really like build interest for it and someone is like bugging you about oh it's time you leave to the desk it's like I know this venue. I've been here for five years. Like I know every corner of this green room is in the same place every year. Production is in the same place every year. Desk is in the same place every year. Can you please not make me stand for five minutes in the lights for no reason? Like it's my job. It's my ass on the line. If I'm late, I'm gonna lose my job. Like so, please just. Yeah, I think it, leave it me alone. Comes a lot from, Don't uh, worry about me. If I'm late, yeah. you get my fee for the event and <laughs> be quiet now. Thank you. You've never it, said it, that. It, yeah, you never said that. But yeah, like, that last it, part, obviously, you added to make it sound I awesome. That. Yeah, <laughs> I did say that. <laughs> okay, but it comes from. It, I think it comes from like girl. people who come from TV. They just don't understand like the pacing, or like they, they, it's not that they don't understand. It's just that they're not aware of you know like this is where I know exactly where I need to be at what time in the show because there's gonna it's gonna go to analyst and then it's gonna go to commercial break and then it's gonna come back and then like there's all this time, but then they're like, oh no, we need you there like 20 minutes ahead because we need you when everybody. Like, no, 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 I don't need to be there until yeah. literally 30 seconds before we go live with the match. That's like, when they're going to throw to me, and that's when I need to go, need to be there. Duncan um, already mentioned food, but I feel like one of the things that frustrates talent the most is just how much time people make you sit around and do nothing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah with like, this is the start of the show, so rehearsal and everything. Okay, uh, come in like two hours before. So you you come to the venue two hours before you're supposed to go live. You go over the talks. You test the mics again in case overnight uh, someone came in and was playing with the mics. I don't know. <laughs> the cables. And, and then you have another hour of just waiting around, you know, and just like sitting around. It's just what, like. What is it usually? It's like if the show goes live at 11, our call time is usually like 9, nine. o'clock is when we, when we have to yes. be in the green room, which means, you know, usually a shuttle pickup is at like 8.30. So, yeah, we always just which show means up wake and, up at like 7 something to get breakfast and shower and all that shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and essentially it just turns out that those two hours are just for the host, for the director to sit down for five minutes and go through the run round just to make sure no one's no one's gone, you know. I, th- I think it has a lot to do is- with, uh, it has a lot to do with um, uh, the producer and the director. It's I think it's more for their benefits that they don't, ha- it's one thing that they don't have to worry about, right? I know where those guys are, good. I don't have to worry about them. I can go on to focus on the next things. Yeah, and that, that, that comes from not working together as a team you know, over a long period of time, right? It's like, it's the first time you work together, then the guy's going to be like, I'm doing it by the book. He's not like, oh, I can trust these guys because I know these guys. He doesn't know us. He has no idea who we are. And so he's just going by the book of like, you know, this is what I would usually do. So that's how we're doing it. No, I mean, I understand it. It is just like, it is just frustrating because some like- For sure. Especially if you're very hungover and you just sit there on a couch. What do you mean, Jay? No <laughs> what do you mean? No. I, what, that tea, does, tea that doesn't water. make sense, though, mean, because yeah. if you were hungover, so, it must have been the after got... party, so the event's over, so no problem. <laughs> yeah. Just going home. What do you mean? Who so, drinks during the yeah. event? Yeah, cheers. Tea and water, man. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of honey. No, but I have to, because I started this, I have to be fair and say that like during the last year or year and a half or so, things have become much better in terms of schedule. This, this was mm. more annoying when you would have days with four best of threes a day, and sometimes you would do all four of them or you oh would do a lot Lord. of them. And then you would have to wake up and shit. So nowadays it's not that strenuous. Like you don't have more than three best of threes a day. So even if you have to sit around for a bit, like back in the days, it was a pain in the fucking ass. Nowadays it's like, whatever, it's like manageable. We can turn this into a real world example. I think Yanko, yeah, you were there for sure. Duncan, I apologize, you weren't. But <laughs> what, what's your guys's? Uh, best memory of Katowice was that 2015, 2016? The one, the, the 19 hour yeah. day that we had? That, that day uh, that I have to, like no, I have to start this off. I think like, you mean my, 2016. No, no. It was the one that yeah. Fnatic won over Lindelof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The one that yeah. went yeah. to like four in the morning far, or whatever the by, day before. By far the best one was the four in the morning day that we've had. Mm-hmm. So two things happened in that day. First thing, they made us coming way early because it was the first day in the arena. So they made us come like three and a half hours before show starts to do the tech rehearsal and everything. But they were so behind schedule in setting up, we didn't, we couldn't even do the rehearsal because they weren't ready, like technically, but then they had to let the crowd in so we couldn't re- rehearse because of the crowd was there. So that was number one. So that was a whatever our day. And for us, we were there three hours before the first game started. By the way, 
congrats to the person who put the first game at like the first game was at noon or something ridiculous like that. Yeah, that was, when you that had was four questionable, best of, yeah. When you had four best of threes in a day. So shout out to the scheduling guy. The second thing, <laughs> something, <laughs> that, something, something that a lot of people don't recall probably is that that was the event where because Machine was doing Call of Duty at the studio, he came in late. So he was the caster for that event. Sato was. was the host. Okay. So what you're is, telling me is Alex so, was late, but he had a good reason. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's unusual, right? Anyway, continue with the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, moving on. <laughs> so that was the day with, you know, we, we all know and love Matt very much, but it was a 17-hour day and he was the desk host. And you're telling me the, the Sadakis guy might have gotten annoyed <laughs> as well, right? Just keep going. I'm learning a lot of stuff here. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> so it's like the last segment of the day, I think, at like... 4 a.m. or something. We're obviously all reamed out. Like, no one wants to be there anymore. And I have, like, I'm so tired. Like, and I'm trying to, like, talk about something. And Matt is, like, pointing like this. He's, he's like, pointing at something. Like, people are leaving or the lights. I don't know what. And, like, he's the host. I'm the first guy next to him. And he's, like, his fingers are in my eyes. And I'm, like, Would you please not, like, uh, like, put your fingers in my eyes, it's like live on stream. And he's like, why? Is this annoying you? Is this annoying you? Like he's using that some sort of a silly voice. Like, is this triggering you? Is this triggering ah! you? Uh, and I'm like, I just stay silent there, just waiting for the broadcast to be over. Remember that still get paid the same, no matter what happens. The Follow internal the, mantra. The, the Henry Dream <laughs> mantra. The Henry Dream <laughs> mantra. And just like, <laughs> Every you know fiber of my body just trying to remain calm after all. Like of this. Semler, that's, you, my, that's my experience. You know Semler in the not because like, I know you've read this novel in the famous classic sci-fi novel Dune. In the first yeah. book, they introduce this thing called the Litany Against Fear, and the idea is, you know, yeah. if you're ever in a scenario where you're being killer. tortured yeah. or something, you know, you say this little mantra that's about how fear, you know, is like not like a real thing; it's just something to do with your mind. And the whole point of why you say it, you know, is to get yourself through whatever that scenario is. Mm -hmm. Like what you. Anko just said there that line of like it's all right just get through the day we still get paid yeah, to exactly. at the end that is what every like talent person just has running in the back of their mind when some guy comes in and it's like you know 14 to 3 in the score but they've just swapped to like ct side of nuke and then the guy's going can you please go to the desk now the game could end now you're like but well, it's not though because they've just got money and the other team's saving but if you could just go to the desk now please and set up at the desk no no but you don't understand this team's really good on ct side and the other team's bad on t side but if you could go to the, the director's asking you to come to the desk now it's like if you're like you have to understand i actually could i know i'm considered like a bit of a, a bit of a bm person you know a bit like unreasonable on that stuff really even i went about even no. i went about 20 events that? still going to the desk and going come on guys we better go to the desk it wasn't until then that i started coming up with my own versions of like well tell that fucking director to come out here right now and tell me you know like because eventually you just get there's too many times you've gone to a desk and stood through like quadruple overtime and a massive comeback that eventually you just like listen homie like they could actually be shooting me in real life and i'm not going to the desk until this fucking game ends like this is it's not happening i've done it I'm, those days have passed sorry like you do, what you do is be flying one would say you even start to like manipulate the system somewhere and tell them stuff like, listen, I know it's your job to tell me to go to the desk at 14 rounds. So you have yes. done your job. Don't worry. I am telling you, yes. But now if you could just go away and then it's I, my I'm fault that I didn't. Yeah, you yeah. start going with that angle, you know, of like trying to break down. How's this hierarchy work? What's the pressure point I can exert on this to still not go to the desk? So man alive. Now the best, uh, that, that was how it was at the beginning of Overwatch League where it was, uh, it was, no, you know, no, 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 everybody's no, figuring shit out. Don't deviate. You need I'm to just talking about, no, no, no. It, this, this ties in, this ties in the same thing. Ah, where it's so just leading into it. it this ties in, in. Okay, this, okay. this ties into my point that I made earlier, where okay. it's like you're working with directors and producers who have never worked with you before. So they have no idea what to expect. They probably haven't even fucking with eSports TSL. So, you know, they, they have no idea what's going on. They're just trying to follow a rundown that they built last week and that they, you know, that they're trying to stick to. Right. And so, you, at, at events like that, at standalone events, yeah, you're going to have things where it's just like, no, we're just going by the book. And you're going to have that guy who's doing exactly what Duncan was just describing, where it's just like, no, 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 this is what needs to happen. And we're like, hey, you got you got to trust us a little bit here. And so uh, Overwatch League, that was kind of how it was going at first because they didn't know us. So they were just like, oh, you need to be here at this time. And I was just like, okay, we, we have the rundown. We know exactly where we need to be. I know exactly the pacing and everything of how things are going to go down. You need to trust me and just let me like do my thing. I'm going to be where I need to be when I need to be there, right? Done. And 
never had that conversation again, right? Never had that kind of problem again. It, it, that's that's that comes from working with people day in day out for a long period of time. Is like you get that trust, you understand each other, and boom, there you go. It's the back and forth. That's always the problem with like CS events when there's like the stress is high and everything's going, and you're working with people you don't know. You know, it, that's where like the tensions come from. I think you know, like Yanko Thor, and you know, it's like, ugh, well, we start we start just like kind of. <laughs> Yeah, but the problem isn't only that. The problem is like there's so many other things that you have to deal with. So that's mm -hmm. just kind of the thing that you know gets you over the top. For example, you know, at some events you need to come in early and have a production meeting every day, like on the show. But because of how well you're treated, like the accommodation is really good, like all the maybe little requests you have about flights or. Uh, about so and so uh, to make you more comfortable while you're at the event, people accommodate you. And then when someone tells you, yeah, let's come in for this production meeting, which, yeah, sometimes you get some good things done, but most of the time it's mo mostly there for the production. So they are 100% yeah. sure that you know what it's going to be coming up in terms of graphics and other stuff like VTs, like videos that you're going to talk about. So they don't just put things up and you talk about something else. Sure, but you're okay with that. Because, you know, everything else is pretty much fine. But at some other events, you have to deal with a lot of bullshit. And then you deal with that. And then, you know, you come to a point where you're dealing with so much stuff that every little thing is going to start annoying you. People are going to be watching this and saying, what the fuck are these fucks talking about? You know, like, oh, mm -hmm. so hard to do your job. You need to be there <coughs> two hours before the show starts. You're only on camera for 10 minutes anyway. You're only saying generic things, blah, 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 whatever. But... You know, the thing oh, is, that, in reality, that there's a lot of things. <laughs> there's a lot of things that we need to deal with that, you know, on an everyday basis that sometimes it just becomes, you know, it's like, fuck's sake, please. I think you get frustrated with the lack of trust with like having to change it up constantly. Like you're constantly changing who you're working with. So like CS, you're going through a whole routine. No, I think you get like more going frustrated whole, by so getting okay. paid late, but okay. Oh, well, all right, that's a whole different fucking option. That's a whole different issue, right? You still didn't say but, your 2016 Katowice the moment. Oh, my favorite, like the best part of that? No, well, you're, you're just your favorite memory of getting fucked on that 19. Well, the, the thing is, is that I was a commentator back then, boys. So, uh, you know, no, that's right. You did your best. I didn't, I didn't, oh, let's not, let's not open so that. Let's not open that. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of trigger I points, Jan Cole, the whole I'm thing where Semla made the whole scene great for himself for a solid year and a half while we were yeah. all still stuck in the fucking mines doing 19 <laughs> Listen, hour days. We'll get into, like we'll get into yeah. Star Ladder. We'll get into that <laughs> Star Ladder. I was, pushing with I was pushing with TOs where we needed, you know, more analysts so you guys could have a rotation too. Wasn't like I was just, you know, like, yes, mine me my gold and I want a solid gold watch. No, listen, Sam was right. Like, he used to go in there and go, listen, guys, I want twice the day rate. I want to work a third as much. And you know what? I also hey, want all on. these. I, have, I, I also want all these analysts to get a break. And they go, right, we can give you the first two. We can't do the third. He goes, I did what do I, I look like. Andrew, goes, I said, what I'm going to have a compromise about? somewhere. What are you talking about? <laughs> Samler, no can I ask you something, Samler, right? I remember you are on camera now, right? Does it at all trigger you <laughs> that you're the one who has the rep surrounding them, that you're the one who like pushes the rates up all the time and you're really money hungry and ruthless when it comes to money? When you were partnered with Anders, who basically was just <laughs> using you as like some sort of fall guy for about four years or something. What thoughts? Thoughts. <laughs> it's been a while, Duncan. Uh, I got some sense of growing, some person. I cannot confirm or deny. <laughs> cannot confirm or deny. The just wondering how that made you feel. Statement. You know. Sumler's just trying to build up that Monopoly Man look at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Where's my top hat? Hold no, he but this isn't the right Monopoly, hat. but this was yeah. kind of how we felt back in the day, you know, like at the fedora going. <laughs> uh, straight mob life. Let's go. Right. We, are you are you in the crew? Or are you out of the Tom crew? Landry, you're out of the crew. We're gonna break your legs and we're gonna send you to sleep with the fishes. That's a that was kind of the approach. Back. But enough about what happened to D Money. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I brought it all back to kind of beat Sylvia. There we go. We're all back. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I can, oh man, I can't even remember like Kevin said we were casting, so I can't remember. Uh, like it wasn't, I, it was, you know, it, we had two best. By the way, so again, if we're gonna if we're gonna bring up stories of things I wasn't involved in, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. It's one that I just alluded to there. So maybe you guys can tell me more about it. One of my favorite stories of all the time was okay. what I call the passive aggressive war for the 
um, final TriCast for, I think it was Karavice 2015 was the one, because it was the one where D-Man had come over to CSGO. Mm. And there was some mad scenario where everyone claims they didn't ask to do this final. But you had that whole politics of like, Anders coming up publicly, like, I will not be doing the final. And then all the fans like, no, please, Anders. And then everyone were like, it's obvious D-Man pushed him out. And then D-Man's like, what are you talking about? I never said anything. I never said who was doing the final. Like, And it was just everyone claiming they'd never asked to do the final. But in the end, they had that weird tricast of like, was it, it like D-Man, D-Man Andrews, Andrews and Henry. That's why I haven't done it, as many yes. finals. No, 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 the weirdest no, no. tricast that was, of all no, time. No, no, that was Cologne. Cologne. That was Cologne. It was, yeah, uh, it was Dupot, Dupot, Sean Garrison, Anders, and Sean. Yeah, right. That was, that was who it ended up with. Yeah, yeah, that was that was that one. Yeah, because isn't um, that like an aspect that people won't know about casting? Right, is a lot of people assumed that years ago there was always a deal in place that this duo does the final or whatever. Whereas, I mean, Richard has referenced this many times until more recently when there were obvious political alignments, like Henry and Sadikist obviously are the EPL guys, so they do ASL finals. Obviously, Bardolf and DDK do the face it events, and then up until recently when it was Anders and Semler, they did the E League final. Aside from that, where it's all vert as to who does the final. Explain to people, how was it decided who did a final back in the day in CSGO? Because it was kind of a, a touchy subject, right? I mean, Ooh. there was never, as far as I know, there was never any real, like, discussion. Like, we didn't have any in point, input at that point, depending depending on the event, right? Like, the, the obviously, like, the third-party events and the Star Ladder. I mean, obviously, if you didn't feel happy about it, you could send an email in. and you know, Yeah, 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 just kind of <laughs> run, 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 just, <laughs> <laughs> just goes to show how well uh, how well insulated the system was. Like, no, but wasn't I, aware I mean, of what was going on behind the scenes. Of the- I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw anyone under the bus, but I, I remember one of like I remember early on in my career, I had two like big disappointments that were like those those disappointments that you look back on and realize they're not as big of a deal as you thought they were at the okay. time. Sure. The one was was not being hired for MLG X Games. Um, which Aspen, been like, yeah, dude, yeah, which would that have been brutal. my like second event ever. I wasn't hired for it, and I was like, "Fuck!" Like maybe I'm like just not good enough to do this, and and I'd only done one event previously. Do not, so but no like, one. Yeah, yeah. I know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That, that you was really... obviously Duncan and Fifth Lauren working together as a duo to farm you out. Wait a minute. Yeah. You you really fair. thought, Jason? You genuinely thought to yourself like, "Ah, maybe I'm just not good enough," you know. You really yeah, worried a, that? a little bit, a little bit at the time because it was it was one of those things where like you wanted to turn it into a career, right? And th- that's why I said I realized looking back on it now that it wasn't as big of a deal. But at the time, I, like I I sent like a whole um, like resume uh, of like my, my Counter Strike experience and like clips of my casting over to MLG to like try and get hired. And I think the the one thing that really kind of tilted me off the face of the earth was the the ESCA Global Challenge event that I'd worked like two weeks or th- a month prior. Sadikus had worked as well mm. and they hired Sadikus and they didn't hire me so I was like motherfucker I know they were watching that shit like why did they not think like I'm the only oh that's why time, I paid him <laughs> at the time I was the only like color commentator slash analyst slash pro experience doing broadcasting in Counter-Strike so it, it really it really tilted me off the face of the planet but obviously like I look back now and I'm like that was silly um, but the other one was Cologne 2015 and this is kind of more to the point is when we had the tricast with yeah. the tricast with Anders and similar and the fact that they didn't have us three do that finals like when I yeah. was on the when I was on the desk for that event for the grand finals like inside I was just like seething with rage and tell me about it like I was just so <laughs> mad. tell me about it dude I had fucking that. d-man take my place dude how fucking pissed was I but I'm not happy. This is not happy. This, this, is, <laughs> this, is like, this is a very good point because of one thing, right? It doesn't really matter whether, you know, for Katowice or Cologne, was Demon this, was Anders that, you know, and all that stuff. The yeah. problem is this. Once you have a person who's doing the, who's doing the event as talent, and he's also determining the talent and determining who casts which game, Sounds like, strangely familiar. Just, just like you shouldn't be in a position where you even need to ask this question, right? That's the problem. Yeah. Like you cannot know. And there's another tournament organizer that's in the same situation, whereas I don't think it's the same as it was back then. No. But still, it's just a matter of why would you even put yourself in a position where someone could ask the question and say, well, exactly. maybe it is because mm-hmm. of this. Like you, I, I feel like... Especially now, because things are way, way, way evolved, way more evolved than they were in 2015. I just think that's something you would don't really need like the 
what's the word from it? Like the cloud from it, like uh, over your like event yeah. or whatever, like that someone could say, or even with like the talent that you're hiring, right? You don't want a person like Jason, for example, in 2015. Right you don't now. want Jason like to think in 2015, shit, is this because like, uh, this guy is also like the talent manager that he put himself in the right spot or maybe it's deserved, right? So I think yeah. it's just something that you should avoid because you, you this don't This is at the first dealing that. major. I had a, I had a long conversation with them about this very topic because they, um, they had, they were, they were fascinated by the fact that in esports, commentators didn't know which games they were going to do and commentators didn't know, uh, who was doing the final. And they were just like, that, that shit wouldn't fly for a second. Like our, you know, it's it's like we have our commentators and they're doing these matches. They know they're doing these matches, and then you know we have our like specific pair that are going to be doing the biggest match and all that sort of stuff. All that shit is like known months in advance. So they were fascinated to come into a major where all of the commentators were saying like, no, no, no we'd rather not know. They were like, wait, what? No, how, how how does that work? Um, and looking back now, that's like one of those things, right? Where it's like you look back now and you're like, yeah, we probably could have avoided a lot of stress and tension if we'd have all been, you know, a little bit clearer about it, or like a TO director, producer, whoever, right, was running the show was just like right from the get-go. Yeah, yeah, this is how it's gonna be, boys. Like, boom, 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 all out in the open, and then you can just go about your event and not have to worry about, you know, staying fresh for the finals or anything because maybe you're gonna get it. You know, like you, it would have been a maybe a different atmosphere looking back over, you know, for a couple of those years where it was less clear as to who was going to be getting the finals. Um, I think I think you like Atlanta was a good like departure point though because I know like nowadays uh, like we all obviously want to do the final but I don't think anyone cares like no one feels insulted if they don't get the final anymore no one feels like slighted yeah like, because you've already done a final so it's not yeah. it's, it's not like that goal yeah. of like because that's the thing until you've done a final you want to do the final oh by the way if you want to know how in this sense how much better csgo and games like dota have things than other esports games right. in league of legends the ultimate accomplishment in your career is to be allowed to be the caster for the final of the, of the world championship right right and what happens is because of they've held that as the big carrot for a lot of these like talent from around the world on the english language streams some of them took like you know some people it took like three or four years to get to that point to where they finally you know like earned the spot and they got to do the final Final. And then there's been cases where, you know, someone else, for whatever reasons, got fast-tracked and he was there in a year or two years. And so even if you're the other oh, guy, yeah. you should you should be thinking to yourself, oh, it's cool that we both made it. Party is going to be like, why the fuck does this guy get there in half the time? You know, like, it's because it's such a big deal, it's so drawn out. It's going to make it a massive deal to be able to whether they get this. Whereas, to be fair, especially back in the day, we had three majors a year. Obviously, we have tons of tier one events. Like, yeah. you, get, you get your feeling like you got your chance to do stuff. Well, it's like yes, going to a face it event. You never had any doubt how it was going to be. A because James is called. Well, to be fair to Bardolf, it's also right, obvious. Obviously, it's also when Yanko was, event, they have their casters, right? Sure. It's like face it event, no, but, they have their casters. No, no, but here's the thing, Sabla. No to be fair. Go. When Yanko said earlier that, you know, it's 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 unfortunate when someone's in the putting themselves in this bad position of like, you know, they can decide the talent, but they're also one of the talent at the event. That, that's absurd. After having watched Bardolf on stream and at show matches, I'm not sure he understands what a bad position is. <laughs> Listen, motherfucker, I'm playing with that guy. I mean, how many thousands of hours does he have in CS? And he's still just like, ah! Yeah, never mind. Um, just had a vent there for a second. Flashbacks. No, but um, I mean, that even to a certain degree, I mean, obviously, I, I, I don't think someone should be in that position. But at the same sure. time, like, it doesn't really bother me because when I go to a face it event, I know that. Dan, James and Dan are going to be casting the finals, and they should be. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't see any issue with that. When I go to an ESL event nowadays, I know Matt and Henry are going to be casting yeah. the final. That, that's fine as well. And similar when you were when, when you go to an E League major in Boston, you know that Dan and James are going to be casting that <laughs> one. When you go to a that one hurt. Blast Four series, which Anders is literally helping to uh, uh, actually arrange, you know that um, <laughs> Scrawny and Londoners are going to be doing that one. And uh, when do I ever get a time, Anders? What was the point in all of this? When do I? When does your loyal servant finally get a break, Lord? <laughs> I mean, if, when, you to, Lord, if you want to go back, you want to go back to it. It was when Anders and I made the decision to commit to E League instead of Pro League. That was the turning yeah. point. That's what opened the floodgates because we were we, uh, would, we would be able to do E League and E League would be our place. Say it no second, no second thoughts about that move, right? Well, we kind of got fucked. Yeah, well, I mean, no that, well, sometimes that's what happens. You, fucked, you know, you got to bend over and you got to take it, and that's just how it went. You know, we we got instead of getting two seasons, we got one season, and then the, and then everything kept changing. And, and then got one and a half. You know, it was, uh, it was pretty it was a bit brutal. 
kind of opened the kind of opened the doors. If you're talking like from a strategic point of view in terms of commentary, that was that well, was a decision a, where it's just like for a political landscape. That was probably the decision that had the most far-reaching consequences. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Because if we, if we'd have stayed with pro league, I think it would have been a different uh, landscape entirely. But um, there you go, right? You make those decisions. It wasn't a bad decision per se. It was just because for people who who are watching who are not quite sure what the implication there is, as I alluded to before, the only time in the industry it actually became set so that everyone knew from day one like which way it was going to run in terms of who does the finals and who is the main casting pair of each of these tournaments came when Anderson Semler signed up with E-League because in signing up with E-League, they didn't have time to do Pro League. Therefore, yeah. it automatically made it so that Henry and Sadekist were the Pro League people for ESL. And then obviously, Bardolf and DDK were with Face It anyway. So then it became natural. You know, it's just obvious as to who's going to do it. As, as we alluded to before, if it was an open event, it, it was up in the air as to who did it. Who uh, it's also, also the fact that back then, E-League was doing uh, LAN uh, weeks. Yeah. It was superior was in every way. So, so, so the thing was like E League would clash with IEM Oakland. E League would clash with Epicenter, right? Yes. So there were these, or there were these other big land tournaments that these guys who were doing E League couldn't come to the tournament. Like sometimes it was James and Dan, but sometimes it was Andrew and Semler. So they couldn't even attend the event, even if you know ESL would have hired them. Even sure. you know, they chose no. E League over Pro League, right? They would still want them to be. At the event, so the same applies for analysts, right? It was 2016, so that was my year when I was like started doing more and more events, and that certainly helped me. The fact that you, Duncan, were like tied up with Elix with some events that would hire you. Oh, I've got a story for you. You've just sparked in me, Yanko. This is one you might like, actually. So as you say, yeah, you're right. If if on the schedule it says, you know, because remember, for anyone who doesn't know, E-League Season 1 was like something mad, like about 12 weeks or something. E-League yeah. Season 2 was not as many, but maybe like, uh, I would guess like eight, six or eight was, weeks. Yeah. Six, like, like you yeah. know, it gradually went down. It's all, it only got to be like a week or so in like 2017, I think, when like it was the first E-League premiere. So before this, right, when we're doing the seasons, I remember for Season 2 of E-League, again, shorter schedule, but still like six to eight weeks or something. I saw on the calendar of like the casting calendar of all the events ah yeah well, so if you do an elite season two which i'm doing right there's epicenter you know there's these other events well obviously you know just no one could do those and then i come in one week and then they're like i'm like where's jason and they're like what do you mean it's epicenter, <laughs> you know and i go <coughs> but he does e-league though and then they go no no we got scoots for you this week and i go so jason's getting a week off this event he's flying out to that other event he's doing that event and now i'm with scoots and there's a kicker here because there's a story about scoots that i'm going to tell right because it was on air so i'm not revealing uh, anything this, private right this now this is a funny and story. people people forget this story because we do, we actually helped scoots out and played it out and styled it out right so when scoots was on the desk with me even though we told him like scoots you are like a legend in the scene like everyone knows you, you're part of the furniture just come on the show you know give any comments you want to give give thoughts about the e-league give thoughts about the teams you know you can talk about anything but because scoots thought in his brain i'm being hired to replace jason he came along with loads of pages of notes that he'd done like he'd done notes on like every stat of like both the teams and like you know like win rate on all the maps and even which side they're winning on so when richard throws to him on one of these segments right like oh what do you think about this team here he starts just reading off these pieces of paper like well 72% win rate on CT side of train when they get it first time, but this time when they go to Mirage, might have some... And then he, as he said all this, right, out of nowhere, he just goes, that's the, the wrong sheet. And then he just like, <laughs> he just, he just, uh, for one second, he looks among the other sheets and then he obviously realizes in his brain, like, there's no way I'm going to find the sheet in one second and start seamlessly reading off. So he just like, he just literally stops talking and then we're all just like, it's okay, Scoots. Yeah, so anyway, the teams are going to go like... But like he just completely lost it for a minute. <laughs> oh no! I did make me die inside a little. Bit. That is that is so good. Oh, yeah, I had to do it a lot. Like and the, then obviously the, the Jason just out there yeah. arranging have fucking weeks off of a show so he can fly out to other continents to do events, leaving me just completely on my own. I mean, it was it was New York. Uh, you know, it wasn't that. You far came away. to Brazil yeah. as well, though. No, I think that was season two. Yeah, um, season two. That yeah, I mean, you were in Oakland as well. I was in a position unlike Quite a few Anderson. events, actually, when you think about it. <laughs> Basically, all of them, you might say, yeah, cool. yeah all the events. Yeah. Duncan, Duncan was the staple. He loved living in LA. 
when he probably told them that, didn't he? He goes, listen, you'll still have Thorin. He, he'll stay for all the weeks. He told me he's fine with that. <laughs> he, doesn't even, he doesn't even think we should go to other events. But anyway, he'll, I'm, I'm going to take all the events off. Star and he'll be fine. No, but I was in a position at the time, this was kind of, as you said, Django, before you really kind of solidified yourself, where I was still, it was like a tail end of me being like the, the kind of, must have analysts on a desk, like a, a, in terms of pro experience. So I was in a situation where I could kind of hedge my bets a little bit. And I remember just being like, I'm, I'm not going to commit to E League because I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know what they're going to do after the first year, right? Like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe they just fully cancel Counter Strike in, in year two. Maybe they just don't want to do it anymore. Um, and, and this is, this is kind of the mantra I've always operated with throughout my four or five careers is ESL is obviously the one TO that you can rely on that is going to be in Counter-Strike hey, no matter no matter what. <laughs> They're going to be in Counter-Strike. Yeah, keep no going, keep what. going. You going, Jason. <laughs> like, it could be a nuclear yeah. winner. They're still going to be making Counter-Strike content. So I've, I've always done right by ESL. And they've always, they've always treated me pretty well. Um, and so, I mean, essentially, no, no matter, <laughs> keep going. just keep going, just keep going. Hang in there, just thinking about something else, about something else. keep going, yeah. Are you tied to the mast or what's oh, going no. on? Hey. Uh, <laughs> shipwreck. Why did I take that shot of rap? I know. The big um, problem is this, Moses, a lot of companies, they can't know if they can keep going for many years because they might have liquidity problems and not be able to pay people for the events, you know? So, you know, if you could get around that problem somehow, you could probably wouldn't run events for many anyways, years. Anyways, you know? I've so. always made sure that I've always been loyal to ESL because yes. I know I just know they're mm -hmm. going to be there. I, I know they're going to have great events. I know they're going to have all the top teams. Um, and I know they're going to, they're, they're, especially these past like two years, they've started producing very, very incredible shows and fixing a lot of the issues they've had. So, um, you know, at, at the time it wasn't so much like Anders and Semler had to pick ESL or E-League. For me, it was just kind of like, I'm going to do E-League, but I'm going to make sure that I'm available for, you know, certain, e they're, they're the major ESL events. Blink, blink twice, Moses. You know, that's one thing, Moses, you, you can say whatever you want on this topic, but that's one thing that I have always found very strange. Because again, since we're revealing sort of some behind the scenes info, this isn't anything too telling or anything. No, this isn't, this but in isn't. line with what Moses just said there, his thinking of sort of like, how do I sort of align myself with the most stable parts of the scene, you know, like the ones mm -hmm. that are less risky. Whereas, for example, in as I gave the example before, uh, Semler actually did the opposite of that. He chose yeah, to give up risk. Pro League and to give up being the premier duo of ESL to take E-League, hoping obviously at the time that, you know, just like E-League season one, there'd be two or three of those every year and it'd be like almost because this is the thing people don't get about the E-League gig is yeah now it's just a week it's just another big event but when it was like that with season one being I don't know 40 days or something that basically becomes like no 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 no, 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 year, you know? no 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 the, the whole reason for for the first for the first move was that E-League season one and two would be five weeks of work or five to six weeks versus the 35 days spread out over three months of pro league so we're sitting here we're just like Dude, if if we can do we can do E League be on LAN for an entire group phase. Like as far as I'm concerned, like that's always the drawback of like the face it and the pro league. You know, it's just it's all online. It, there's you don't have that. Whereas e, that's that's what really got Anders and I. We're like it's worth it. It's, this is the risk because this is going to be so much more fun. Is that it's all it's all on LAN. It's all there. So you're going through the groups. Doesn't matter. Everybody's there. You know, and you're all on location. You're all doing this thing. And also. It, you know just how long it's going to last and there's no bullshit in terms of scheduling. There's no like, oh, we have to reschedule these days and all this shit that can happen with online. It wasn't going to happen with E-League. So it was a big it was a big risk, yes, but it was also just like a big step up in quality of life because, well, we got to do full land fucking tournaments in CS. That wasn't that wasn't the case at all, right? That was so to, to go like it was a big risk and it was definitely opening the door for it you know, took a lot of people to move, three years but, to make that change and not because they wanted to. But um, you know, E League, that's uh, that was like the big play at the time because it was just like it was like five to six weeks of work. You're gonna be there for that season. It's all on land and it's gonna be sick. You'll have the big finale and then you and then you go back and then you're free to do other things. Whereas you know, Pro League, you'd still have to be plugging along. Anders and I did Pro League and it was like three months of constantly going back and forth between Cologne and Stockholm and Copenhagen for Anders. It was a lot of travel, a lot of being on the road, a lot of living out of a hotel. It was tough. So. You know, at the time, that was the, that was that was like the big carrot on a stick. Was just like, holy shit, we can do full land everything. Like, I wonder what's going to be possible. You don't know the the online league gets rough when the thing you're looking the forward the most is like the sandwich you get at the end of the broadcast <laughs> that you can take to your hotel room. Dude, Chad has never or been the fifteen minutes walk back in the cold, rainy, 
windy Copenhagen weather. These so, fucking, these fucking I miss that. guys, man, were so obsessed with these goddamn sandwiches in Copenhagen. <laughs> yeah, it's I've heard. Believable. It's started with Chad. It's started with Chad. I Sorry, with Chad. I've heard. I've heard. I've heard he gets like the, if you want to get Chad well, proper. Angry, the first season take- we did in Copenhagen was 2017, right? That's when Chad was clinging on to anything he could get to keep his sanity. That was before he moved to <laughs> Europe officially, right? So he was right. still like a resident of Australia, Perth, and was just my, living in a suitcase. So understandable. My, my favorite story of Chad, I remember we did the, I did, I worked his, fr- I was the desk host for his first season as an analyst of Pro League when we were in, we were in Cologne. Um, and I was hosting the whole season. I did the finals. Uh, and, and it was just kind of like his first like main experience with an actual online league of like those extended schedules. And I remember as we all were at times, like I know, Yankee, you probably have this. I know I had this. Um, Duncan, you, you've always been like this, but you have this like desire with Counter Strike since you know we, we used to play, and you want to point out all these cool things that are going on from like a, like the subtle tricks that professionals are doing, and you're like, man, I would love to make a, like a piece of content around like why this play was so good or why this this play wasn't sexy, but it was, but it's incredible, and it's the reason why they won the round, and you have all this idea for really in depth tactical content that never gets any views, that never gets any traction, that no one ever actually watches, even if you put five hours into it and actually make it look great. Um, It doesn't get any attention. And I remember the day that I think Chad broke, I'm pretty sure this was the day. Um, because we'd all been telling him to like calm it down, you know, take take your time, you know, don't <coughs> rush into things. Chad saw someone throw a Molotov on Inferno that would clear out a position to help them take like a portion of the map. So he sees it during the game and he gets all fucking hyped and he gets all like fucking Counter Strike turned on and he rushes over to his PC at the desk and he's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna clip this and I'm gonna make like a 30 second video and upload it to Twitter. And it was he he shows the Molotov that they threw that they missed. And he shows the right way to throw it, and then he shows like the reason that you throw it, what it's going to help you do. And he okay. just posts this like forty second video on Twitter, and it gets nothing. It gets like 10, 10 retweets, maybe like you know twenty five likes. Like no one gives a fuck. And then the next night he comes in, and Matt and Henry are both happen to be wearing Hawaiian shirts, Here and he go. takes a picture of them, and he's like, "Oh, it looks like Matt and Henry. May, it looks like Matt and Henry going to be going on a cruise sometime soon." And gets like three hundred likes, gets like fifty retweets. It's on the front page of the subreddit, and I think that was the moment he broke because he realized, like, as much as people want, like. This is this is the issue I had with being an analyst for so long. This is what like made me so soured to it was let it out. You you are expected to come in in every single segment and say something that is going to blow the minds of yeah. the revolutionary. Gonna revol- yeah, you're getting into Jan Cole's trigger area yeah. here. I'm going to tell you, know, you Jason. Exactly. You're getting into it. You're treading on thin ice. <laughs> you're supposed to revolutionize the way that someone sees the game, or you have to either never to seen think, before moment. Yeah, you have to either tell some someone something they don't know, or you have to be fucking hilarious and tie it into Counter Strike. But like, it's Hello, it's Duncan. not it's Hello, not Duncan. possible. It's not possible to to really do either of those things in every single segment. Oh, of course, so, yeah. And as an analyst, you have no tools to work with. And I I just know I would, Yanko, you know this pain really really well. Is when you show up to do a desk and they're like, hey, um, we know we've contracted you to to be on on the analyst desk, but on top of that, we'd also like you to dig through like. 30 hours of VOD reviews and, and find like five really, really big rounds that we can highlight. We want you to edit these and, you know, pass over everything you want to talk about for a pregame desk segment and do all these things that you're not actually paid to do and help us produce this desk, desk segment essentially. And it's like, as an analyst, you're just like, please, can I just get a little bit of help? Can I have a telestrator? Can we use in-game footage? Um, and then obviously a game goes into overtime and they say, you know what, that that piece of content that you worked two hours yeah, on. We're gonna skip that. Yeah, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna cut, that's the first no, thing gone. Uh, yeah, but the, like, best, please. but the best part is when y- they do ask you for that extra stuff and you're like, you know, you don't want to. You know, it's not up to. You're not. It's not like the pro, pro, the producer is not paying you. Like the director, it's not the guy that's paying you. Like the payment issues from that come from some other people, right? So sure. you know, the 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 producer is usually like a good guy, someone like you're working very closely to. So I want to like do it for him at the very least. I don't want to be an asshole sometimes. So, okay, I'm like, okay, let's do all this stuff. So I go through it. I prepare some cool stuff. You know, even in like during the game for the post game segment, I prepare. And then they're just like. 
I say it like sometimes, yeah, like usually you need to say it in the like when you get to the desk before the post game segment goes live. The host needs to tell the producer in his ear that you have a thing, right? So he knows to put it in the rundown, like to throw to it and like maybe cut something else out because that's a segment you always want to have. If like an analyst has it, you always want to put the telestrator in because it's a cool, uh, cool segment. So then you do it, you say it. The host says it as well, and somehow during the whole segment, it's not thrown to this thing. And that's like what people have asked you 115 times. Every post-game segment, I want to have a telestrator piece. I don't care if it's the simplest thing in the world. We need to have it. We need to throw to it. So, of course, it always happens in a really good game, right? It happens in like, you know, an uh, SK Astralis game or an SK Phase game in 2017, you know, like... Uh, some mad moment where you can really like point out like the great uh, game sense or the team play from the teams and then it's just like oh yeah like the TD he didn't like switch to your feed or the graphics guy didn't pull this old you know some guy fucked up the most basic thing and that happens every day I had so many tournaments where every day at least once or twice something like that is fucked up so how do you expect me to every time you tell me this, to be like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. I'll have it for you, boss. Like, it's coming up, you know, like, whatever you need, I got it for you. It's like, at some point, mm-hmm. you're just like, well, you want me to, like, do whatever I can, and then you're just going to tell me, like, we can't do this, or this is not working, or, it's, you know, whatever. Like, at least when you ask me to do extra stuff, at least you can make sure that it can be... I'll give done, you a, a perfect you know, example. Like, uh, I'll, put, I'll put what Yanko is saying now in context to show people from the perspective of an analyst why you get truly triggered. Because that in itself is triggering, but it's when there'll be a segment like that, like Yanko or Sponge is like, we are doing my Molotov round like that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll get to it at the end of the segment. And at the end of the segment, right, the guy throws to the break, and he's like, sorry, we, like the producer's like, sorry, we had to cut the segment. Yeah, running short on time. And then he's like, but wait a minute, in that segment, we had like a bit where Orgia just went and talked to a seven-year-old kid in the crowd who was wearing a liquid jersey and they were like yeah, yeah production wanted to keep that in you know it's a grip like sort of feel good pick. like I, I, what is this that, that oh. is the most disposable part of the show that no one cares yeah, about but it's, not, it's <laughs> not even like I understand there needs to be a lot of fluff I understand there's a very like small percentage of hardcore viewers who are really into like the super in-depth stuff I just think for me it's not about that it's not about pleasing the like one or five percent or however there is of the hardcore people it's like showing the casual viewer just like peaking their interest right like you guys know and probably a lot of people know by now like i got really into nfl and i think there's a lot of comparisons with nfl and and counter-strike right so i was a noob coming into nfl like a couple of years ago but the fact that color commentators during the game and like some of the analysts were like pointing out some stuff that really seemed like it was advanced you know that's what got that's what got me into the game because yeah. you know like if if you don't see that for me it's just like i thought it was just like yeah just people running into each other and bashing heads and who's going to push the other guys off but then you see there's actually a lot of thought process behind it a lot of strategy if you want to call it that way tactics right so i was like Oh, so this all like one thing. Uh, that's why I got hooked to it. Not like, mm-hmm. of course, you like to see athletic plays yeah. and like, you know, mad players making mad plays. Of course, like people want to see simple Nico call zero, like fallen, make their plays, right? But it's like when once you know there's more than that, there's a thought process behind it. Is what got me hooked. So that's what I want to do. I want to like get some of those casual guys, show them this. And if some guy is sitting there in his chair and he says. Shit, this is not just about like headshots. It's not just about aim. You know, this guy positionally, blah, 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 blah. If I can get some guys to buy into that, that's where I got my satisfaction from like being an analyst. And that's where I thought like I did a good job. And a fan comes to me at an event and says, Hey, you really got me into this. Like, I really, I didn't know like it was like this. That's like the best compliment I can get. It's a good feeling, man. Like, Lisbon was sick. The number of fans I met there was just like, and they were all so fucking hype. It was. (laughs) Sorry. But, <laughs> they were uh, the home team. Uh, yeah, no, for you guys, it was fucking dope. Yeah, no, I meant, you know, obviously the news that just got posted now. Never but, understood um, that myself personally, why people from Portugal are like, well, they speak the same language, so I guess we support well, them. It's, not like, it's not like fucking UK fans were cheering when Cloud9 won the Boston Listen, like, I, well, whatever, I think this is really harmless. I've got a funny I story. I can tell you, Duncan, right. it's not like that in this room. 
Okay. Yeah. Like the same language, you're not necessarily. No, but we're we're talking about like sure. putting on a show and shit. But I was laughing my fucking head off at Lisbon because going into the finals, right, like before the finals, it's that third place match at Blast, right, where it's just like it's gonna be like the aim duels and all that shit, and you know the the team gets to pick, and because of that, you know, right, where like all the all the fans in Lisbon, you know, they were like bad shit for MIBR. And Savage goes up and he's just like, who do you want to see? You know, is it, it's going to be Cloud9, crickets, you know, is it going to be FaZe, crickets, you know, and then it's like, is it going to be MIBR? And everybody's just like, ah, right? Everybody goes crazy. And then fucking Rush, <laughs> Rush goes up he, and he's like, who's it going to be, Rush? Is it, it's going to be, who the fuck, FaZe? Yeah, that's right. They played FaZe. And like, obviously it's just like crickets flat, you know, like when everybody in that whole place wanted to see them play against MIBR. You know, he obviously picks phase, and uh, obviously he can read. Shout out Rush. He, no. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. He just, like, you can see on his face, so he's like, I done fucked up. But no, no, no. Behind the scenes afterwards, I'm walking through the halls in the in the venue, and I see one of, like, the head guys of Blast, you know? And uh, he's just like, he just had to pick phase, didn't he? Just had to pick phase. <laughs> like, but I'll give you I'm I'll, like, there you go, bud. I'll give you this little <laughs> nugget, Sam. So... Uh, on day one, because I saw, you know, like obviously it's Portuguese in house and all, all this, sure. all the stuff like that. So I wanted to have, uh, because, you know, like I knew like we were the home team and all of that stuff. And in Sao Paulo in 2016, me and Jason had a great little bit with the crowd yeah. that was waiting outside the venue. And, you know, I just love how passionate like, uh, all those fans are. So I thought, you know, obviously our, we were playing were awesome. standing we're and all of that we're, stuff. We're, and, you know, I already knew like things were going to change with the team. And, you know, it was an event that no one really wanted to be at, right? Like, it just like we wanted to be there because of the crowd, because of the, the we knew like we were the home team. But, you know, it was a broken team at that point. So I want to like bring some extra hype. So I wanted to, I went to Blast and like told them, hey, give me a, a bit. Like, it doesn't have to be on stream. Just give me like a minute with the crowd in house with the Portuguese guy so he can translate for me. And I had like, because what we did in Sao Paulo is I had a chant for the Brazilian fans that they could oh. have for SK. Yeah. So I came up with, with, uh, with another one for MIBR because MIBR is a fucking hard name to chant. <laughs> like, but I came up with one. So I was like, just give me a minute so I can tell them like I had something along the lines of, yeah, like we're from Brazil, but we know this is like our house, blah, 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 blah. Like I had like a good piece. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it after this little like thing or after the, the mayor talks or whatever it was. And I was like, yeah, cool. I'm going to be with the team. Just come get me. And like it didn't happen. And I, I thought like, you know, of course the crowd is going to cheer and everything by default. Right. But I thought this was really like going to get them fired up. So, so I was I was a bit disappointed. Yeah, it didn't happen. Usually like I know like. Last guys are all about like the show, and I'm just I'm I just think it was a bit of miscommunication in in their ranks. Like if someone sees this, they're gonna be like, "Fuck! How did we like been, not yeah. do this?" But I, I think it had, those lines, but it had to it have been a like, miscom. Because I remember telling Nicholas, we, we told Nicholas in the green room, we were like, "Go grab, go grab Yanko. He wants to do a segment. And it's he he understands the show, and it's gonna it's gonna be sick." And he must. Uh, I think it might have just been lost in translation between him and production and whoever needed to come. No, for, no, for sure. But the point is just like that event was so awesome because you can see how across. I know the, the guys from the team were telling me this. They were at that Moche or whatever event that was in June or something, right? It was yeah. an event. They beat Hellraisers in the fall, whatever. Like it's a small event. There was no one there. And the crowd was so hype. It was, a, it was the same arena. For that event, even and the crowd was chanting. They were doing like the football chant, like soccer chant, and stuff like that. So, like I knew coming into it that the atmosphere was going to be insane. I knew that the crowd was going to deliver there. So, yeah, it was a uh, awesome to be like a part of it to experience that. And I'm well, really they, hoping like they go back there next year. I, it was an awesome they full on carried that shit over because I talked to a couple of the fans at the at the venue and I was like, "What were you guys singing before the the grand finals went live?" And they're like, "Oh, we were singing the anthem because at every football match, you know, no 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 massive sporting thing can start without the anthem." And so, what and apparently, country like, just does that, that remind me of? I I was just like, "Holy shit, dude, that yeah. was rad!" Like it was actually like crazy. It was painful to be in that hall. It was so loud with everybody singing. It was so loud and it actually hurt. So that was that was like. A, an intense way I, to start final. Well, wait, I, wait. Before we sidetrack too much, okay. we still have one thing left. Jason okay. did not say his favorite 2016 oh, yeah. Katowice moment. 
Jesus Christ, I am gonna throw it all the way back. I am Problem is, now he's thinking to himself, no, I did so all that no, stuff about no, how I'm gonna I work with the ESL. No, 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 yeah, no, yeah, no, no, ESL. No, 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 he knows exactly what I mean. I know exactly, exactly what, what I mean. All right, let's hear it, let's hear it. What um, was it? I'm trying to weigh the pros and cons of telling the story, and I don't think I can. Well, I mean, after all, of, never mind, go ahead. So you can give the redacted <laughs> version, for at least. Yeah, I'm trying to find a way to redact that story and still have it have the impact that you would like. <laughs> I think there's a way to do that. Um, right, do you ha do you have in response an alternate story from a different event that is a good story that makes up for you pussying out on this one? No, because yeah, the level I have to go back on this one is is a bit much. Um, I I don't, my my favorite my favorite part about Katowice or not my favorite but like my like one of those you know memories that you look back and you laugh because you you can't, you don't want to cry type things is at the like Lauren and I casted the final game of that series to an empty empty stadium in Katowice so we could hear the echo of our own voice coming through the speakers because they still had the caster volume on inside the arena for the 20 fans that were left at for whatever reason I think I think at one thirty kind of star morning, series you know a throwback I, to Minsk. I think the last the last Navi doing so well. Okay, sorry. Started go ahead. at started at one thirty in the morning is when our BO three began, and it was Astralis versus someone I don't remember who or not. They were they were I think they were TSM at the time, mm. um, and I think it was TSM Fnatic, and we got done with that, and that was at the point where like. You know, as the day goes on, this is a classic at events where you're just like, yeah, these games have gone late. It's now one in the morning. You know, we haven't eaten in about five, six hours. Can we get some food? And they're like, yeah, we'll do our best to eat some KFC in here. And it's just like, well, something because I haven't eaten in six hours. I would just love some food. Um, and we, we didn't get any food before we went live. I'm we, feeling like KFC four in the morning kind of beats it, Paul. It's probably not happening, Jason. Just, just my guess, again, yeah, as an well, outsider. This is, not, this is not one in the morning, so I feel like it could have been possible. At least oh, okay, some sorry. shit. But, you know, once you get to the end of that BO3 and it's like 3 o'clock and that's the end of the day, finally, this 19-hour nightmare that we showed up early for is over. And they're like, guys, we know this was a long and stressful day. Um, it was, you know, thank you guys so much for sticking through it. And we're like, yeah, no problem. You know, shit happens, whatever. We'll do it better tomorrow. Um, and they're just like, all right, well, uh, shuttle's going to be here about 10 minutes. It's 4 a.m. You guys are going to get back to the hotel. And uh, shuttle's going to pick you guys up at 7.30. So we'll see, you, we'll see you bright and early. And it's like, fuck. Fuck my life. <laughs> like, by the time you get home to the hotel, at the moment you step foot in your room, if you fall asleep at that exact moment, you get three hours of sleep. And, it's just like, fuck. <laughs> and you never fall asleep at that no, point. You not. never fall Call asleep not. immediately. So it like, was, what, could not to mention I, you've been chugging <clears throat> fucking Red Bulls and Monsters just to stay awake to do your cast and have some energy for it. So you're all fucking wired up. And well, just, I think the best way to put it is whoever was sponsoring that event, we were chugging that energy drink for hours. Yeah. yeah, I think it was Red Bull. That <laughs> Cheers time. to them, the real heroes. Yeah. Shout out. Because for people who don't know, this might sound like some sort of mad first world problem type complaint that like, oh, wait, mm -hmm. yeah, when I was finished my long day talking about video games for a massive amount of money, I couldn't go straight to sleep. So I had to stay up a bit longer and didn't get full sleep. Like that sounds like the biggest whine ever. But people don't realize when you literally get up at eight in the morning, go to a venue, don't have any time off. Because as we're talking about, you know, at any point in time, you're preparing for a game or you're watching a game or you're talking about a game or you're having your dinner and then you're doing another game and it goes all all day long one of the biggest problems ever is as jason says when you get back to the hotel room and technically you know you're supposed to just get right into bed that second because you're already only going to get five hours sleep six hours sleep the problem is nobody can just go their whole day without having a moment off so inevitably you're still going to take an hour or two and watch something on youtube or watch a fucking tv yeah. show you didn't watch it because you have to have some time to yourself you got to get one moment to yourself I mean, you can't just go straight to sleep like that's one thing i actually had to learn which took me years to do was like sometimes you have to like do that every now and then but like sometimes if there really is like a fucking joe rogan podcast it's like three hours comes out it's like you can't watch this whole thing dude you got to just watch like half of it and then do the hard cut off and be like i'll watch the next half tomorrow because it's too tempting i think it's also people like forget that what we do it's a job it's not a hobby like it's not a, like at the end of the day it's a job and no matter how like easy or uh, how alluring it is to some people to think yeah this is just you would do this anyway no you wouldn't like you wouldn't watch every single game that we watch you yeah. wouldn't do it some of these games are absolutely dog shit it's like even in playoffs even deep into playoffs some finals are dog shit shout out to Sandler. but 
<laughs> okay, then. You did have some pretty bad finals, Samuel. Yeah. Yeah. Samuel, I've got a question for you, right? That so, was the point. so it's not like just to before you ask. Just yeah, to yeah, say like on. you know, like yeah. If I was like at home, I would do like some of this stuff, but I wouldn't do all of it. So people can say, yeah, but you do like no. It's like it's yeah, a job. At the end of the day, just like any other job. It's a job, so it's not as simple as people think it is. And you expect to be treated professionally in your, yeah. in your job, no matter Don't what your job. Right, thank so, thank, thank hey, what for the services you provide. I do want to know because he's probably chilled happened. out. I'm sure he's chilled out a bit over the years now, Samla. But my favorite year ever in Samla's career was 2016, right? Because as we've alluded to, you know, Samla was in place. He had E-League. Henry and Sado, they had ESL. Dan and James over at Face It slash E-League, you know. And what happened this year was even though, you know, obviously getting E-League finals, Some I think, did he do the ESL in the York? No, that was Henry and Sado. You know, you got your fair share of finals and big matches. But mm -hmm. what was great was when I looked back over 2016, I was trying to remember all the big moments, all the hype games, all the great casting calls. Somehow that year, think back to this particular year, that was the year where even when they didn't get the finals, Dan and James just got every fucking hype moment. They got... Called Zera jumping up shots against fucking. Well, that was MLG. That they was got Columbus. That was MLG. Yeah. So team. listen. So and then was... they got then they got simple against Fnatic at ESL. Yeah. Like these tournaments, they aren't even getting the final, and they're getting all the insane hype moments. It was actually ridiculous how many they got that year. It was nuts. That's one of the the. the and then you and Anders would be like queued up for the game, and it'd be the most boring comment. game ever. <laughs> Yeah, that can, that's one of the demoral, demoralizing things that can happen with commentary is that sometimes it is just the luck of the draw in terms of the quality of the match and it, whether or not you're going to get an oh shit moment. You know, Freiburg, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, all like Dupree, huge plays, you know, like these sorts of things, they, they, it's so, it feels like you're catching lightning in a bottle, right? Or you're trying to, right? When you get those kinds of matches. And so whether you get the finals or not, that, yes, there's the prestige of getting the finals. But actually, from a commentary perspective, sometimes you actually want to get the semifinals because that's where the teams are more evenly matched. And so you may actually have you may actually have those moments that come up a little bit more frequently because the teams are evenly matched and they're gonna go three maps and it's gonna be batshit and there's gonna be crazy plays left and right, and that's that's gonna be the thing. So sometimes getting the finals actually is a detriment is a detriment because the finals will be a blowout. And so it'll be two maps. It'll be just, you know that Astralis are going to win or you know that this team's going to win. And so you know that there's not going to be any hype moments because they're just going to fucking crush right through them. Shout out SK Liquid. Let's go, boy. So, I mean, um, that that was that was like 2014. Uh, not 2014. 2014 was, was pretty good. We had our moments then, 2015 beginning of. But like, I, I remember, you know, like MLG Columbus, I lost my voice. I actually lost my voice screaming so hard, get fucked from the balcony when Cold Zera did the op jump shot. Like I was literally just leaning over, shouting at the top of my voice, get fucked. So and well done. <laughs> there you go. No, but that's it. That's the thing. Then they got into the final. Yeah, like then it then it was just it True was, Patriot Sembler, of course. Things. Get fucked. Uh, over. <laughs> yeah, I was just like get fucked, right? Because like it was just like a fucking crazy play. You know? It was like so bad shit. And then the finals come along and it's a blowout and you're just like, oh great, okay, cool. Um so that was think, like from a commentary perspective, that was always the thing where it's just like shit. Uh, think, you know, you never know if you're going to get that moment or not. I think too, that's where I think there's a lot of, I guess, misunderstanding from from the the average fan of like how much a cast because that was the year. Remember, 2016 was the year where you really started to see like, oh, you know, guys like DDK and James and guys like you know Sedicus and Henry are bringing way more hype than Anders and Semler. And it's like I think people really misunderstand how much hype you're able to bring to these blowout games. Like, of course, like, yeah, you, dude, it's a fucking nightmare. To, you have to ride that fine line where, um, you know, you're not overhyping average and silly plays, but you're still getting excited for the really good plays that happen. And and when you're not getting any, and if you look at all the finals you guys did this year, because I've done the same thing that Duncan did. I went back just for just for my own sick pleasure and was just like, wow, they really got shafted in pretty much every grand finals they did. They were all blowouts. And I did I did two or three of them with you guys that year as the yeah. TriCast. Um and LG Columbus, that's when we did it, right? And the weird thing is, like, normally if it's a group stage, if it's, you know, even maybe the quarterfinals you get away with, if it's an online game, you kind of compensate with humor, right? And that's mm -hmm. that's where you and Anders really built your 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 class was, like, being able to just banter back and forth during long online delays and making funny comments and going off on tangents and all that all that kind of stuff. But once you get into the semifinals and even, even the quarterfinals a little bit and then the grand finals, 
you're, you can't be humorous. There's supposed to be yeah. gravitas in that kind of a scenario. So if it's a blowout, you just have to sit there and fucking play patty cake for like an hour and a half. But it's it's not easy. And I, and I remember thinking that year, I was just like, wow, this is this is unreasonable as fuck. Why are they getting wrecked for not bringing it? It, it affected Anders a lot more than it affected me. Like Anders would legitimately get mad. Like legitimately yeah. get frustrated with it and just be like, "What the fuck!" Like, I mean, I think everyone gets wrecked. frustrated with it a little bit, but yeah, certainly but that year, I think it hit I, him a, a bit harder than usual. He, he was he was feeling it more. I don't know. I had more of that that thing where it's just like, "What goes around comes around." If we just hold out long enough, we'll we'll get a good game, right? So I I, I was trying to stay positive, but I remember Andrew's getting like pretty frustrated with it. I mean, no, to be fair, I was frustrated too because it's just like you know, shit. There's nothing you can do. You know, it's like I I want to do the finals, great, but at the same time, I know the finals is going to be shit. And in the meantime, I'm watching DDK and Bardolf cast fucking Cold Zera blasting people out of B, B apps and Mirage or simple dropping out of the heavens and no scoping some fuck 50 that, feet away. You know, it's like, uh, you can't. That, that's just one of the things that you just got to do. It's, it's important to throw this in here. It's nothing. It's not like this is like a personal like I would prefer. You know, no one's saying that I would I would rather have these moments like I would I would rather DDK and James or, or Matt and Henry. No, that's not what we're saying at all. Right? That's not what we're saying at all. It's just the contrast just before yeah, that comes. I don't up. care who's there, commentating. Someone's gonna just, it's just the lay it, of the land. It's just the lay of the land and it leads to the, the growth in the con in the community in terms of your the, the power of your brand, right? If you keep having hype moments, that's what people are gonna see and that's what people are gonna like and da da da, right? Yeah, that's why it was so weird to me at times, like with casters, right? Like who's doing this game, who's doing that game, but in reality, it's just like who's gonna get the moments and sometimes like who would have mm -hmm. thought the Luminosity Liquid game is gonna be so sick at the Columbus yes. Major, right? Yeah. It would probably it put, be a run over, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. you would have you would have put some of the if you could pick you wouldn't have picked that game, right? Costly. But it turned out to be a, a game with like a lot of epic moments. Can you tell me one moment from the grand final you remember? I don't remember. I, I just remember F X sitting on, on his desk. Yeah, That's all like I, 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 I can't. And casting in front of that crowd. I remember I, that as being. Yeah, I remember the last round of the game was Taco like getting three or four kills and, and, and winning the game, right? But I can't remember yeah, like a clutch or anything. Like when you talk about MLG Columbus now, three years later, right? A year from it, like you would remember maybe some planes, but the plays that remain are the plays like the cold zero jumping thing. Like heck, he got him a graffiti. Like you know, it's like those like the all of Meister diffuse play. Like the those Hico are the plays. You one know. versus four. Yeah, exactly. The Hiko one versus four on cash, right? Like the Hiko, are you kidding? Like those are the plays you remember. And I think the Hiko, are you kidding me? Play might have been even in the groups or maybe that was in the groups. Yeah, it you was, know, it, was, so uh, like, it wasn't in any like big match. You know, like so, like some of those plays, you just remember them no matter what. And some games can be like really disappointing. Um, and, and you think they're <laughs> going to be super hype, even in terms of matchup, right? Navi Astralis, maybe at the, at the face it major, you would have expected to have been a lot closer, a lot more interesting game, but it simply wasn't. Astralis Liquid at the same tournament, right? So even, you know, our game against Liquid in MBR game at Pro League finals, you would have expected to be. Like closer and really like see like how these teams fare against each other. We got blown out. So like sometimes you just get disappointed. So for me, it was always weird like to get back to it. It's like as a caster, yeah, you might on paper think this would be the better game, but I think it has shown like you cannot really ever know. So like getting mm. uh, like too caught up in it, like it's just you know it just the, the whatever that and the problem with this is with the tournament organizers because people might not know, but. A lot of the times, especially with smaller tournament organizers, they come to the casters and say, you guys want to create this schedule for yourself. How are we supposed to do that? How are we supposed to say, yeah, these guys are going to be doing the finals and you yeah. guys are just going to like sit there and watch. That's so like unfair. That's like the tournament thing where you ask the players where they want to restart the round or not. There should be a rule book in place yes. for that. Just yes, as there yes, should yes, be yes, a person at every tournament who says, this is like who casts what. And that's their decision. We're their employees. They pay us for this tournament. And if they want us to do the final or not, that's up to them. It shouldn't be up to us. That's ridiculous. That's Can a change I... in philosophy. All right. I mean, that's just a change in vision in terms of like coming back to the comment that I was making earlier after the comment, conversation at E-League, all that. Um, it's just uh, knowing who's going to be doing what before events. I think that should be the standard going forward to avoid... I mean, it's obvious. I mean, that's the thing. It's obvious. Every time it was just like, oh, we're not going to say. It's like, you know who's going to be casting which match and all that. You know how it's all going to go down. Politics, but let's, baby. Let's, let's leave it to chance. What are like, we waiting no, for? To see if someone's going to do a bad job or a good job? Yeah, or? no, that was bullshit. Everybody, no, yeah, whatever. All right, sorry, Moses. Go ahead. 
No, I just want to make a, a proposal because we've we've all you know had our had our fun with this first hour, but let's not make this entire episode about you know complaining and the negative aspects. Let's let's get to some of the no, no, by- positive. And positive things. We've all. Well, I will say, guests. here's the thing, Moses. In line with what they were saying there, whenever you're having a day where these complaints happen, like the food's bad, or you got yeah. up really early, or you didn't have much sleep, or you you're on the the last game, and so you're staying up forever, and every series before yours goes three maps and overtime, and you think, fuck it all, like what's this day going to be like? The one thing that can save you. This is where, like Yanko said about how it is just your job. I always tell people this: if your job was like street sweeper. Right? So not a very classy job, probably not a very fun job. It wouldn't matter if someone said, right, I'm, you do the exact same job, but your salary is $10 million. Would you now enjoy sweeping the suite? Not really. You'd like the money. You'd like it when you got paid. You'd be loving the money then. But when you actually do the job itself, it's still just as shit as if you got paid a dollar an hour to do that job. It's, it's the same in some ways. Like if all these problems, yeah, it sounds like a dream job, but they are still problems. Like it still sucks to have bad food when you're getting paid a lot. Still sucks oh, to yeah. be jet lagged, you know. So the point I'm getting to here is the one thing that that saves you with any consistency is if you get an amazing game. Like if the last game of the day is the fucking best, like in fact, this is why every time I do like a show with Richard where we're trying to like pick the event of the year, I always tell him it's basically unfair because even while I want to think of things like the venue and the logistics and, you know, all these things, in reality, I nearly always end up just defaulting to whichever one had the games that I remember the most vividly. Like if you had a, a, a event where... Like, I'll give you a great example. That first ever ESL New York was the one where they actually, like, fucked up by doing a Swiss system with eight teams that didn't make sense, and then it was only four teams in the playoffs, and then, you know, like, there was a few reasons as to why this wasn't that sick an event. (laughs) Yeah, there was a bunch of problems, but because the games, like, obviously the semifinals games, like SK versus Verts Pro, and then Verts Pro versus Navi in the final, because these games were just straight fire. I still think in my brain it was, like, one of the best events I ever did, because it just made me biased. But that's really, it's because that's obviously the main reason you do it isn't it you want to see the fucking sick game and be part of history or something but the tos feel it just as much as you as, as we do right the tos yeah, are also course. sitting there just Look like face it mate at this last major like, <laughs> they're like just crossing Dude, your fingers I, that's why I, that guy had that reaction in the back halls at blast where he's just like he picked phase you know i'm like, not exaggerating why is he not picking mibr like, right you know people because understand he wants to win the money doesn't want to so, lose. Yeah, no, obviously, yeah. There's no reason why he would want to do that. No, but people like people understand that. Obviously, I was going at face it hard over this last major and like fuck them, etc. But even sure. I felt bad after their playoffs finished and not a single game basically was good. And at the end, I was just like, Jesus, you guys just can't catch a break. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. After that's all that's your that's problems, then your entire playoffs suck, and it's not even your fault. The teams just didn't you finally get, get one. You but finally get the major, and, and, it's, and it's a total wash on all fronts. It's just Jesus. You can't, you, yeah, you can't catch a break. If they had had like even one good series yeah. in the whole tournament, or if the but, final had just been good to give you a good memory, you know. Yeah, but a lot of people like I, I think they like are not aware of this. What you just said, Duncan, is like at the end of the day, like no matter what you're going through, if you still get a good game, you're gonna be like super hyped about it. Like you're gonna be glued to the screen. Like mm-hmm. you're gonna do your best work, even if it's been a sixteen-hour day. If the last game of the day is like a really insane game, you're going to do a great job. And that's not because how much you're getting paid. That's not because you're thinking, oh, yeah, like I'm in such a good position compared to some other people. No, it's just because of our like sincere love for the game. That's why everyone Mm. got into this. No one, not, uh, not, none of us here got into CS because, oh, yeah, one day I'm going to be the best analyst in the world and I'm going to make a living out of it. No, like everyone came into it because. To something we had fun doing and then everything around it started growing and it became something we could call a profession and we could make a living out of it and so on and so on but i'm never gonna stay in cs because of what i'm getting paid i'm gonna stay because i still have love for the game and i still feel like it's something that brings me excitement like people would you know, laugh if they could see the green room in some of these games when we're watching and we're jumping around, they're screaming <laughs> like little kids, like even oh, after okay, those green rooms, years yeah. and, and even after like, <laughs> yeah, even after all that stuff, because that's just, it's just how it is. We all like love CS first and then everything else comes yeah. second. Except Sembler, of course. He just, he literally will just go anywhere for the money. So. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> there we go. There, the whole time he was saying that, I was thinking like, this is a bit awkward. If you yeah, like, I'm sitting here, I was like, <laughs> Sam was like, yeah, me too, me too. Yeah, love that shit. 
you know, when I was a boy, I actually dreamed of being an Overwatch caster. That was my first life. And, uh, <laughs> yikes. No, obviously that is. Obviously that's right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, it is. I think for me, for me, it was, it was, I mean, the games obviously help, but, but for me, it was, it, it was the show that we put on. Like, I think back, like some of the shows we've done have just been so much fun. Like, I still think Dream Act mm-hmm. Malmo 2016 was one of the most fun shows I ever, ever worked on. And I was like deathly, I was deathly ill out of that. I was sick the whole fucking time. Yeah. I was and then spreading over to the analyst desk. I was doing both. And I was sick, and it was still just like so much fun. That was one of like the first events that I just had like an incredible time. And I think that's what people have like a misunderstanding about when they see like this group of commentators and all the events that we do, and they think it's like some fucking conglom- like mafia conglomeration designed to keep us all in power. And I think in reality, it's one we we have an incredible amount of fun together. Obviously, although not when someone looks like that fucking loser. <laughs> Uh, Imagine and, that popping up on yeah. Tinder. <laughs> and then two is <laughs> like it goes back to what we started the show with when when Yanko has his little comment on the bus leaked by a Chinese journalist is we all hmm. know we can trust each other. Like we all know that like we can. Yeah. We can, well, yeah. no, here's the thing. That is actually a but big that, deal though, Moses, because like for yeah. people who don't know, one of the rare times I've ever gotten mad at people in like the actual industry, like legit, like this is unacceptable, is any time along those lines, people have like leaked things that were said in the green room. Because I told people that it's absolutely unacceptable. Like it's the same yeah. in sports, you know, where you have certain teams that are like legendary teams. They have like the locker room culture of like nothing leaves the locker room because it's supposed to be like the area where you can have like the real conversation and stuff. Like if anyone ever leaks anything from a green room, like, I-, I go mad. Them, because it's like that should be your space to sort of yeah. cut loose a bit, you know. That's exactly that what a green room is. Report you're, what you it's your fucking safe space. Like, imagine, imagine if there had been the best like, term, term to use, yeah. but I get what he's been there, Moses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Matt Sadikist is over there with the crayons in the corner, you know, and soothing a little music box, you know, before his game is safe. What are you talking about? I know what you mean. It is a safe area in which to talk. It's not the crayons, Duncan, just one correction. It's little cars. <laughs> that's true matchbox yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 yeah and then what happens is moses goes like, oh sick 1v3 and he goes yeah yeah so yeah but yeah to be, he does like, the loop the loop no, again jason 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 was uh jason 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 had a good point it was like why do we mm. talk, complain and blah 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 let's talk about some of the good stuff but in reality like what we would all say the first thing would probably be the camaraderie right like in some of those like uh, tournaments, moments where we were like getting reamed out, where like we were working like super long hours. What, what kept us going again wasn't the money we were getting paid, wasn't like anything like that. It was the fact that we were there and like kind of having fun with each other, you know, laughing, like talking some shit and just like getting through like the day. And then, you know, whether it's like having a drink or like having some food at the end of the day, like together. All right, that and- reminds me of a story then, Yanko. So if we're going to start off with actual like legit heartwarming stories, <laughs> people yeah. won't know this. And maybe Yanko hasn't even figured this out himself. No, listen, just well, this, like, it is heartwarming. Okay. But the fact that we were doing some degenerate things in our bonding doesn't mean it's not hard for me. No, no, of course not. No, but it, I mean, you might not remember the genesis of this story, but one of the reasons why, as part of my persona, like obviously for a long time in CSGO, one of my favorite players has been Device from Astralis slash TSM, et cetera, you know, yeah. this, but, and obviously I built into my joke part of, because since everyone tries, it, what happened people do in CS is if they know you like a player, they just try to like use reverse psychology to get you not to say nice things by going, you just love that player, don't you? Why, why are you going to suck his dick? And so what they want to do, right, is make you think, oh, well, since everyone knows I love him, I should like not say that I like him much. I should just criticize him more. But I don't fall into that trap, right? So what I do is I just build it into my persona. So as a result, I make it like, yeah, well, obviously I give Device the MVP every turn at course, guys, what are you talking about? So as a result, I made that joke where to like to to cover my bias because obviously he's had loads of games he's choked away i made that like joke that like when he chokes he's just a vice then but when he like goes god mode he's devy and he like transforms in result yeah. ego. that actually comes from that yanko so he won't know why though because every time that we would be watching these games and obviously this is in the era when astralis and tsm did lose a lot of the matches right every time device would like fuck up a massive shot yanko would just really sarcastically go 
Devin! It's just like, and so I, that's why I had to like take it back. I had to like take it back for us and win it, you know, like reclaim it. Because that's like that's just an example of the sort of things people do. Because the other thing is, when you're in a green room, you also know from being around these people so much exactly what triggers each person. So if you want, you can just fuck with people to an unlimited degree, obviously. Yeah, well, for example, I... for Jason, you just offer him an non-alcoholic drink and he's immediately like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> What is this? Why am I always this coffee is coffee. Irish? Listen, yeah, why coffee. am I always painted as the alcoholic in the group? <laughs> He's like some Mad Men right character now. or something. Look at someone right now. <laughs> He's fucking drinking booze. I know yanko has got one in front of him. The, this is iced tea. <laughs> I will just yeah, say. Yeah, that's the ultimate. I went, uh, I went to, I visited Yanko in Belgrade and we were staying in, in uh, Cologne doing a season. I went out there. Tell for, them which uh, day you landed days. if you want. Oh, I yes, this this was uh, this was interesting. Um, we we set this up like a, like a couple weeks in advance. I flew out there for three days. Really wanted to see Belgrade, um, and we didn't realize it at the time when we did all the bookings. But I, I landed and I get off the airplane and I'm walking through the airport and there's all these pictures of uh, of men and women just on on the walls of the Belgrade airport and everything like that. And I obviously can't read the language or anything like that, so I don't know what the fuck's going on. And you know, I'm going through customs and I get a message from from Yanko. And he's like, "Hey, I didn't, uh, I didn't realize this when we booked the flights, but today is actually the 20th anniversary of when the UN and the United States bombed <laughs> my country." And I was just like, "What the fuck?" I was like, <laughs> I was like should, I, "Should I just get back on the plane? Do I just go buy like a new ticket and leave? Like, do I need to get the fuck out of this country like right now?" And he's like, "No, no, no, it'll be fine. But you know, if you ever piss me off this weekend, I'm just gonna push you into a crowd and said you love you love Bill Clinton." <laughs> and so, I, I, anyways, we, we partied the whole weekend. It was it was great. Like I I uh, we, we went out to the club. Like Echo was incredible. <laughs> um, went out to dinner and everything like that. But on like the third day, and I'm like massively hungover. You know, I'm I'm a little bit older than than Yanko, so I can't I can't handle the pace these days anymore. Especially in Serbia, when you're out fucking binge drinking three bottles of vodka until just five cold drinking here. But all right, yeah, exactly. We go out to lunch, and he orders a bottle of wine. And I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, I just need some water. Like, I need to just chill. And he's like, yeah, it's wine. We're not, we're not drinking. It's, it's just wine. And I'm like, this doesn't work. That's not, that's not how everything. That's not no, how this everything is the works. best part. This was the, so. This was the third day. The second day, I take Jason to a friendly game between like a Serbian club and a Russian club. It's one of the two biggest clubs. It's called Red Star, right? Like they played in Champions League this year, so I'm sure. really make this short. So Jason like buys a couple of souvenirs at the shop. He buys like two T-shirts, like two hoodies. <laughs> Or something. So we go the next day to this restaurant. It's a super nice restaurant, like in a nice part of town. And he comes in in this hoodie, which is like the hoodie of the ultras, like of the hooligan. So he looks like a hooligan, basically. Yeah. So he's like okay. coming in, and and it's the wrong part of the city to wear it in, right? To be fair, Jason, if you haven't spoken, you are also a guy who's got a shaven head and like stubble. <laughs> like you look like a hooligan. So, dude. so 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 this is the best part. It's in the wrong part. If it was in the right part of the city, right. okay, it would be fine, right? But he's very classier like, area. What are you doing? It's not just the classier area, it's the area where the other club has their fans, I see, right? right okay. So I like the Jason, thing. what are you doing? Take this hoodie off, like and he's like taking it off, and of course beneath he has the t-shirt <laughs> from the same yeah. club. And I'm like, all right, I get it. That reminds me of this time I took Jason for the best. Let's just hope for the best. That reminds me of this time I took Jason to this basketball game in Alabama and I was like, we take that hood off, Jason. <laughs> Because he had this hoodie on, you see, of the rival team. So, I, whatever. That, that went close enough to the line, but I kept it back, Jason. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, speaking of which, that actually oh. does... That that does remind me... Obviously, that never happened. That was a joke. Right? None of the things... Okay, I'll just say as a disclaimer at the top. Everything I say about Moses is possibly a lie in design to ruin his career. No, one thing, though, by the way, which actually... Oh, it, this will sound like an irresponsible thing for us to do with our job, but we actually are good enough that we can get away with it, which is when you are talking and having all this banter in the green room and stupid things happening, like all the other things in esports going on, you know, that aren't at the event that you're reading about on Twitter, the amount of times that we've purposely tried to work things that were like certain words or phrases into like desk segments and commentary things purely to try and either trigger the other person on the segment with you because they can't show that they know anything or just 
just everyone in the green room watching, just trying to say something about some stupid thing that's happened or some edgy joke. The amount of times we've done that successfully with no one guessing is unreal at this point. No, but my my favorite is always going to be na 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 na. Yes. Dude. What what Sam was referring to there was when we did, I think it was DreamHack Summer 2015, was when the movie Jurassic World had come out and they paid for like no. you know, an advertising segment on um, what? It's when, it's E-League season one when he had the moving desk. Oh, that was the best thing ever. Oh, yes, we brought that back for that. Yeah, you're right. Oh, that was, was okay. It originally yeah. came from this event before. It originally came from that. DreamHack. It originally yeah, you're right, actually. Yeah. That is true. Go on, That's... go on, Duncan. Tell yourself. And the whole yeah, point on, was, yeah. at the original event, though, what we were doing was, it was when Richard was the host at the time. But yeah, we would just do that. And when he was supposed to do this segment, where all he did was read out, you know, like Jurassic World in cinemas now from, you know, July 8th or something. We were just doing that all the time. Like, no, 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 no. And then eventually we would just get in reports back from like, the producers. Like, the uh, sponsors have requested that you don't sing or say anything during the Jurassic World segment. It's like, fucking hell. Can we catch a break here? Can we have some fun? But yeah, it's true. When we went to E-League, they had that thing where one of the big gimmicks was one, the, the, moving the desk, desk yeah. could move across the hall. In fact, you might remember season one, you know, like we'd swap from one area to another. And then, yeah, we would do that whole thing again. Sadly, Semler, we already had on the episode, I was talking about the By the Numbers episode, we already told the story of Jason. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go through it anyway for you because we're going to get more stories. This is a really quick version. Like, since since we always used to make Jason do the rundown of like the rounds that he was highlighting, we always used to say, because he looks like Professor X, like go and get in Cerebro then. And as we uh, re- retold the story already, there was one time where Jason tried to jump the gun on us saying that by just saying, right, guess it's time for me to get into this wheelchair then. And then we were just looking at him like, what the fuck? What are you? And then, by the way, I'll... Jason, the one detail I didn't add to that story, I've realized now that completes the story. Because this is the part I need to mention, is that whenever someone does something like that, obviously we do know what you actually mean, but we are all cunts and we'll definitely pretend like, what are you referring to, Jason? I don't even know what that means. What is that? What does that even mean? It's a bit like when Richard one time actually did, you know that thing that me and Henry were doing years ago where for some stupid reason we kept saying like, EZ, PZ, liquid squeeze Z, or some shit like that. Some stupid thing that we just kept saying, right? Well, one time Richard tried to work that into a desk. I think it was at MLG Columbus, and he goes, Well, Thorin, I guess you could say it was EZ, PZ, liquid squeeze Z. And I said, Why would you say that, though? What does that even mean? And, going, and the look on his face of betrayal of like, You're the one who even read that up. You're the one who says that. I'm trying to work your material in now. And I was just going, Doesn't even mean anything, Richard. It's just completely meaningless. You know, anyway, moving on. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome, selling each man. other down the river is one of the best parts of Comrade. There are a few. There are a few. But we yeah, had some good times. I mean, we, we definitely had Go some good times. That's, that's always going to be like the psychological thing, though, is that coming out of events, you have to make a mental effort. When you do enough events, that's all, and that's just, I guess, like human nature is that you're going to remember the bad and you're it's much harder. Oh, of course. To and so, you know, after so many events, you know, a lot of the events stand out. It's just like, this is the bad. And you, you're going to remember that coming out of a venue. But there are some events that still stick with me where it's just like, holy shit, that was fucking epic. And I fucking love it. And I'm never that like, you know, like MLG Columbus when I was shouting my head off. But also when we got to cast and they had the, fu- the like the caster area was sick. We were like right out there in front of the crowd. We could interact with them. That was so cool. Like I had so much fun that event. I think that event in the grand finals, we even have there was there was a segment during the grand finals, I think towards the end of the overpass game during the blowout, mm-hmm. where some random guy from the crowd just during a moment of silence where it just happened that neither Sembler, Anders, or I was talking, and you just hear in the VOD, some guy from the crowd just go, GG motherfucker. <laughs> just like out of nowhere. <laughs> and it was, and it, we could just hear all of us crack it up. And it, it's, it's so much fun having that kind of like crowd interaction or being able to have that kind of an environment as, as a commentator. Um, yeah. That's, that's, cool. that's forever going to be like a highlight for me. MLG. Club. And it's nice to, it's nice to still have those moments like Lisbon. I mean, obviously it's fresh for me. It's fresh in my memory, but Lisbon was also batshit and awesome. Fans were sick. I, know, what I mean, I, I remember, were... dude, Anders. All right, now hold on, Moses. You and I, the first cologne. I was gonna say that was what I was gonna bring up in the back of the arena. Yeah, we had the, the clappers. 
And that was when Kenny jumps fucking into the knifed fight. Guardian and knifed Guardian, and the entire crowd went went nuts. And Semler and I were like standing at the back of the floor portion of the arena, and just mm -hmm. wow, there's a sick picture of us as well. I think yeah, uh, that, that I, I'm, I'm sure we could find it. Like it's definitely that that's one of my favorite moments as well. I remember it for yeah, like, so was, clearly. So it's just awesome. like holy shit, Guardian! Like Kenny just made Guardian his bitch. Like what the fuck? Let's go, boys! The last in, in time a, it ever happened. Ah, uh, well, you know. <laughs> I mean, not they've, they've both coach. seen better days at this point in time. <laughs> they have fucking hell. Like, what about this then, Yanko? What would yeah. your favorite moment be from working an event or some like something that sticks out in your mind or one of the first things that comes to mind? What would you pick out? I think the first one would probably be straight off the bat. Uh, ESL One Cologne, the first time I attended it, which which was mm -hmm. in 2015, I was still an observer at that point. But that was like the first event that was like in a, such a massive arena and had like yeah. a lot of people there and they were actually like cheering, chanting and all of that stuff. And I was like, is this really a Counter-Strike tournament? You know, it seemed more to me coming from Serbia, like a basketball game or you know, something like that where, you know, so many people hyped up and chanting. So that was really where I was like, you know, as someone who was in it, like, you know, for the majority of his life as a player, I was like, did, did that game that I've been playing really come to this point that we can pull something like this off? That was really like a wow moment for me. And uh, I really enjoy ESL One Cologne. I really think it's like if I could bring my friends or... Anyone I know, like to one event, uh, I would bring them to ESL One Cologne. I just think it's yeah. a special event, and I'm really happy that the first year it wasn't a major. It was 2017, I think, yes. and it yeah. was still filled out, and it was still. There's never been a bad ESL Cologne. Let's yeah, know. so I'm just <coughs> like I'm that. That's definitely been like the one highlight moment for me. For well, sure. think about it, right? Like it's it's perfectly located right in the middle. It's super easy to get to from everywhere in Europe. There's a lot of like hotels and housing and everything. And I don't know how this last year went, but that was that was always a highlight event of the year, hands down, done. Just because you could also like that first one. Remember, like the Virtus Pro, like the full on. They took over an entire section yeah. of the goddamn yeah. venue where they were just chanting and cheering and going batshit crazy every time. Oh, don't would worry, play. and then. Sembler. You'll like it. Go. Go. I've got a little story for you along those lines, right? right so on, I, but like real quick, yeah, go on, like, just the, the 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 one that I fucking loved was also the fact that there were two busloads of French people who came over from Paris that drove in, and they were up in the rafters. And we, I think it was the desk in the finals when I was on the desk, and I could hear them singing the, the yeah the Marseillaise. They could they were singing the national anthem, like just getting fucking pumped with all the flags and everything. And I was like, this is. Un, un fucking real like i i was like over the moon it was so hype just like having the different chanting chanting groups and everything because along these lines right there's two angles on this i want to bring up one is that yeah you're right there's a section that even up until recently that i don't know if they have it anymore because obviously virtus pro is not a big team now and obviously they don't go to some of the tournaments but yeah when vp was still like a permanent fixture at all these events mm -hmm. they used to as you say have a cheering section in the the Lanx Arena in Cologne, which was called yeah, the Polish Corner, you know, like they would all put, and when I did my first ESL Cologne was the 2016 one, the one where it was last a major, the one that SK won and, you know, yep. they, they were playing against Liquid in the final, right? At this particular tournament, right? It's my first event working with ESL again, you know, obviously we had the Rocky relationship for a while. So everyone at ESL is trying to be really nice to me, right? And I was actually thinking like, wow, it's fucking awesome. Like they, you know, they go really going out their way. Like it's, you know, you could have done it the other way. You could have been like, you know, we'll, we'll sort of let you back in, but you know, we're a bit unsure of you or something. No, they were going out their way to be really nice right so this guy comes up to me from esl and he says oh good news we got rid of the sign and i go what, what, what are you talking about what's what sign and he goes there's a sign in the polish section you know the one that like they had that big banner that said like like poland remembers thor and all like poland didn't forget or something really i was like i, I, was like, I, I don't know what sign you're talking about he's like yeah it was massive like it took about like five people to hold it up but we took it away anyway so no problem I'm like oh brilliant yeah it sounds like this is like 2016 as well like years later and then the other the angle fuck? is i used to say similar along the lines of what you guys were saying here about all the positives of cologne i always used to say it also has an advantage no other event in the world has that because at the time this is in the past there was no really good german team it was the most neutral 
crowd and you would always get an amazing crowd. Obviously, yeah. the year I formulated that as a really good reason was this year. And I kept saying it right up until this year's Shout event. Like, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And then obviously fucking big made it to the final and just blew that whole entire angle, didn't they? Like, it just, just meant nothing yeah. at that point. Yourself, time. Jason, by the way. Yeah, there's fucking that little unfair invite, eh, Anka? Exactly. Is this a joke? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, yeah, that's a perfect was, example. I've been doing it for years, boys. You know, yes, that, I'll get that, break every now and again. That is a perfect example, by the way, of what goes on in the green room. Like, even though we would all obviously agree with Yanko that, like, at the time they invited Big, they actually didn't warrant being invited over some other events. If you know that someone like Yanko is getting wrecked like that, obviously you just make a comment in the green room, like, Big's doing better than you thought they were like Yanko. You know, you, you, that's exactly what people do just to, just to trigger yeah, each other in it. Take, like take a job you know like just to make it more and of course they go on and they, they shouldn't have made it past the groups of course they beat S sk at the time right right before yes. they yeah. became mibr so they beat a really good team before that they sneak past renegades and then they get they should have lost that match one yeah that was overperformed very, very at that point even so yeah. Well, I you mean, know, I speaking of which, though, I've got a story. That, this is the one that I definitely find to tell. Is that along those lines, though, of triggering other people? Like, I remember one of my favorites was when obviously everyone knows Sadikis loves racing of all sports, race car <laughs> driving, yeah. you know, and he's really into it, you know. And Yanko obviously doesn't follow any racing sports, but would continually just interject in conversations to say stuff like, <laughs> like, as, as Matt would be going, you know, like waxing lyrical about fucking Fernando Alonso, his favorite driver, Yanko would just be like, yeah. It's just a shame Lewis Hamilton's better, isn't it? Like, you know, just say something like that. He would just lean over. And even though in Sadikis' mind, he must know, like, Yanko doesn't always talk about, he's just trying to trigger me. It would work every time. Obviously, it would get the rise out of him, Duncan, wouldn't it? Duncan, he did. He did come back to bite me, and I'll tell you how. 2017 Pro League Finals in Dallas, right? The finals are in Dallas, but the group stages are played from Burbank in L.A. Oh, so we have to fly from L.A. to Dallas for the playoffs, there's a day off in between. So we do that and there's this massive storm in Texas. So we like have to land in Austin and we're stuck in Austin for like eight hours before we can take on off. On the plane, not yeah, even all, the all the plane, like, on yeah, the plane. Yeah, we, we have what? to be on the plane. And of course the, on the, the, plane. the one person I'm sitting next to is Sadokis. And it's not just this, it's the fact that that was the time where he had this accident with his car Oh, where uh, right. a, cer a certain person, about that way, yeah. a certain person didn't like close the trailer properly, so his car just like fell into the ditch. Oh, okay. oh is, yes, when he got, it's when he, no, it, it's, it's it when he got his car back, but then it rolled down a hill. Right exactly, after back, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. It got stolen, and it, <laughs> someone forgot to lock it up properly and like and tie it down in the hit in the in the trailer. So it rolled out, fell into a ditch, and busted up the rear bumper and rear tail light. Like this was this was maybe like three weeks. Oh, right. After after he had actually gotten it, okay, and this is one of my favorite moments. So ever, but okay, and enough. dude, this this is actually hilarious because it was Yanko, Sadikis, <laughs> and then across the aisle it was me and then Chad, and <laughs> Matt leans over in the middle, and Yanko's already dealt with this for a little bit. I think I was asleep when it initially came out. And Matt just leans over, and goes, "Yo, you you were you were sleeping like." Um, Take a take a look at this picture. It's my car and the busted up rear tail light and rear bumper. Did you have dad. to suppress laughter? No, I didn't even suppress it. I laughed in his <laughs> face. <laughs> Jesus Christ! What the fuck? <laughs> I thought it was so funny. Holy I shit! Thought it was so funny. How? And, 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 and I'm just looking at Jason. I'm like, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> <laughs> why oh yeah, the, remember the circumstances. They're basically locked in a room with at this point in time for many hours no, to go. That, was, <laughs> that was hour two of seven, and it was. It was just like I just laughed Jesus. in his face about his car, and it, it was a dick move. But I just found it so funny at the time. But I mean, that's that's something that we've all like. I mean, I'll tell the story. And Duncan, you're involved in this, and and I mean, obviously, this is uh, you know, I guess it's in a way my story to tell was MLG Columbus when I had some like cr criticism on social media and Reddit um, about me, and so mm. I was already a little bit sensitive. And Duncan or Richard, I don't remember which which one it was. Probably probably both of you motherfuckers um, made some. <laughs> we used kind to of go a, hard back in the day. <laughs> some kind of a comment on the desk, and we got back into the green room, and like I, I at some point like on the walk back to the room, I like I just snapped like something. Thing, something just broke and we, we make the joke we like every every major there's one person in the group who has their freak out uh, you know it's gonna happen yes of course once a major and mlg columbus happened to be mine and i remember just getting back into the green room me me duncan richard and there was probably three other people in there and i was just like i just turned to them like oh, this you guys have really have to fucking stop doing this shit like I, i'm just sick of it i'm done with it and 
we didn't like Duncan and I didn't talk for like two days after that. And yeah. like we were doing desk segments together, but we didn't talk outside of desk segments. Um, and I know like, I mean, I, a little bit yeah, awkward. <laughs> I went, I went back and I, I apologized to Richard, like 30 minutes after it didn't accept it. And I apologized. To Duncan. <laughs> Classic Richard, <laughs> non <laughs> acceptance of an yeah, apology. So funny. Like, was, it's like trying to sue for peace terms in medieval times. You know, you make the first attempt similar, but sometimes yeah. that, that guy gets killed and you have to send another guy, you know, another envoy. I went to Richard and I was like, Hey man, I just want to apologize. You know, I snapped. I went a little bit too far in the greater room. Like I didn't, I didn't mean for that. Like, I don't, I, I don't hate you or anything like that. And he just looks at me and he goes, great. Not <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> That's genius. And this, and this uh, was like my you never expect that, do you? I'm still, yeah, I'm still pretty new. And I was just like, <laughs> well, well, fuck. Where do well, we go? Well, that's my career tag. Now, These are the people I'm locked in a room with for the next four years. <laughs> I know. Um, but I mean, later, I think it was, I, I think it was later that night. Like Richard came up and he was like, "Listen, I'm sorry. Like, like we'll just bury the hatchet. It's all, it's all good. Like, I understand." And I think Duncan, you came back like two days later, and you were like, "Yeah, it's, it's, it's all good. We'll move on. Let's just enjoy the rest of the event." Blah blah blah. So I mean, we've all, I think we've all, we all have a story that we don't have to tell, obviously. But I think everyone in our group has a story of where they just snapped on someone oh, in the course. other group, and we're all yeah. able to just apologize. And move on i think that that's the cool part for me is that you know i fucking hate all of you well it's because for, is, for people who don't realize it's like must be nice as you as you hear when we're explaining a lot of these circumstances even there are very few events that have like a very smooth sailing basically there's most events have like delays or problems or, or like we say a segment gets cut or you get put mm -hmm. in a game you don't know what you're going to do so there's all these minor things which as Yanko says normally it's not really the drink that you couldn't have that tips you over the top it's that it tips you over like that's not really the thing you're mad about what you're mad about is like all the fucking lack of sleep you got the bad travel and then you had five bad games and then someone said something annoying and then someone comes in and they're like oh here's that pepsi max you wanted and you're like i asked for a full sugar fan or something and then they're just like yeah, oh this yeah. is good enough and you're like fucking hell like you know that's the thing that puts you over the top but as a result that does remind me of something else which is as i alluded to before where even though you're supposed to be mates with everyone there is a phenomenon i noticed years ago which is this if you're the one that something annoying is happening to it's really frustrating and you feel bad and you're really annoyed but somehow if you're totally unconnected and it's someone else in your circle in the green room who's getting annoyed it's really funny actually and if anything you want to provoke oh, yeah. it more <laughs> and point out all the things that are really annoying them like <laughs> somehow that it sounds fucked up but it just that is the way it works like There's as long as it's cathartic it's cathartic you're sitting there like I feel better now, even though you're not you're making like if work. Richard's ever in one of his wars on Twitter and I'm just unconnected. Oh, yeah. sat over, I'm just watching him the whole time. Like, where's he going with this? One? Oh, Richard, they're really talking shit. And you're not. Wow, you're not going to let him get away with that. Are you like, you're just like the worst hype man in the world. Uh, talk, talking about MLG Columbus, that's where someone did the same thing to you. But yes, yes. I can oh, agree. Yes. That there's uh, there's few things as entertaining as it is a Serbian telling a British guy how the food is so great at an event in Poland. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. One of the first, so first event I ever did as talent, like an international event, was Katowice 2015 as an observer, right? And no one knew me, like, you know, you know how it is when you're like an observer and no one knows you, like, you're like, who the fuck is this guy? I don't even want to talk to this guy, but... I was in the, so back then in the catering, there was like lines and stuff because there were so many people and they didn't right. get enough food or whatever. Long. And I was like standing there and I noticed someone was close to me. Like, I can't remember who it was from the casters. There was like two or three of them. And I'm just standing there and we already introduced ourselves like the day before. And I'm just saying, huh, this looks more like home now. Like, you know, waiting in lines for food and everyone just like <laughs> cracked up. And, you know, like that was like my way in that. And the fact that Anders is like a fucking failure at being an adult. So I had to go with him <laughs> once he arrived to the mall so he can buy plain shirts because he, he <laughs> only had, he only had <laughs> shirts with like lines and stuff, which looked horrible on camera. He didn't have plain shirts for the broadcast. So they were like, Anders, we need to go buy these shirts. And then for whatever reason, they told me, hey, could you go with Anders so he can buy this stuff? I'm not sure if, if it's because they thought Serbian and Polish was the same language. Okay. Or it's because they thought <laughs> hey, you know the German, land. Anders is just incapable of buying a shirt by himself. Could be both, so right? Really could we be just both. need you to go with him to make sure he buys this thing. So whatever it was, like uh, I'm grateful for it. Me and Anders really bonded and uh, 
You know, that is a, know, that's another thing about casting, though, is that the other joke that we all have is that when we actually got some success in money, that it just changed everyone. So I'll give you a great mm-hmm. example. Everyone knows... Everyone, just Jason. Everyone knows that, for example, Yanko went from, like, having his really bad suit when he first did the events to, like, a year later, he had, like, fucking slick-looking suits, like, boss. fucking watch on. Like, that's because Yanko actually got the money and quickly leveled up. Does anyone remember Anders for like three years wearing that same black blazer to every fucking event with just a normal t-shirt on underneath? It's the same exact black blazer. I was like, dude, how much money do you need before you just buy another jerk? Like jackets, like the real suit. fucking pinholes. It still had the pinholes from the fucking general What a Anders cheap motherfucker. Meme. That had to tell you when he ruined his jacket by putting like 30 fucking pins. Of course. The, dude, I was like, <laughs> the fuck is this? No, here's, similar. here's the sad thing. I thought he was just like, you know, he was like Dexter out of Dexter's lab and he just had like 50 of the same blazer. It was the same blazer. It was just yes. one blazer yes. being one for like 25 events in a row. Dude, I imagine that's what like a parent feels, you know, when it's like they got the, they got the, the nice and all that shit and the kid just like jumps in a mud puddle and just starts like, da, 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 totally. I was like, what the fuck? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, it speaking of which, though, in line with what I said before about knowing things trigger, yeah, I will say one problem, and part of this is just out of boredom when you're at the event or you want some excitement, you know. The other thing that people do actually like to do, even though no one probably admits it, is also you like to trigger people within the green room to fight with each other. Like, I'll give you an example. <laughs> I won't say the people, but everyone in this group will know who I mean. Okay. But someone in the casting crew once said, like, how many event, how many majors have you worked to fuck another member off, of the crew? Dude, and so I just, so I, <laughs> so I just, this out, fuck off. so I just said out loud, well, obviously he's worked as many events as you hired him for since you used to be hiring people. And then obviously immediately both people are just looking at each other like, <laughs> fuck this motherfucker. And it's like day two of the event or something. And I'm just sat back like, and now we watch. Now we just observe. Like, you know, I just like slide back into position. Like, all you need to be is that like, you just like that one guy who says the one little line, you know, that like is the catalyst of the argument. Yeah, That's you're a pyromaniac. You, yeah. you just threw the match into the fucking haystack. You're just like, just, <laughs> just chill back. Just chill back. <laughs> <laughs> just waiting, you know? My exactly. favorite I remember, because, I remember that moment. No, it was, because it was obviously, moment because obviously, you know, analysts are at, uh, you know, they're in a worse position than casters are in today's like day and age. So it's nice to be able to say it now, isn't it, young my, my, you know, my, my, I'm fa- getting emotional. Uh, my, <laughs> my favorite thing was <laughs> pitching the two casters who are paired together against each other, right? Yes. Like this sounds yes. a bit too harsh, but it was just like it's not like literally just like poking a bit, you know. So when like one okay. of the two guys like fucks something up or he's a bit lazy, just coming to the other guy and says Ah, uh, bro, like, I really appreciate, like, you can really tell the hard work you've been doing, you know, like, you know, coming yeah. to the color guy and saying, like, yeah, like, your play-by-play has really become, like, great. Like, you've been doing it a lot lately. <laughs> it's just like a trigger. Course, yeah. Well, yeah, this motherfucker is fucking, like, yeah. you know, on his phone the entire fucking game. When someone has to cast the game, you know, and shit. It's like, you know, yes, along similar this lines. Is, this is what I wanted to see. Give me I'll more. Gi- I'll Dude, give you a great a, analogy. Getting 10 hours in a green room. You'll appreciate right. this, Samla, because th- technically this is just a story about me, even though it is a Brian scene story. But you'll appreciate this. Just like this, this whole show, <laughs> Duncan. In some ways. But this is a story, right, that will... There's a perfect example of exactly that sort of, like, borderline <laughs> evil impulse to fuck with your friends is after MLG Columbus, we were getting to the last days. It's like the playoffs, you know. Might even have been the last day when, you know, maybe someone did their last game was the semifinal. Obviously, you have the finals doing that, you know. At one, at one of these points, we're in the green room, which for us was actually like a sick fucking skybox in the nationwide. Yeah, it was, it, was like it, was it was a really baller place. And so because we had such a cool area, people did stuff like bring, you know, friends of theirs up. So Richard had a friend and then like Sadikis brought his parents because obviously his dad's super into hockey, you know, so to him it was cool to be in this hockey arena and see that CS was so big <clears throat> and do you remember this story right when we were there I was talking to Matt and his dad and his mom as well was there and then you came along and you were talking to us as well right and just to be a little troublemaking cunt I just said like you know what Samler right now you're on and this is when Sadika's family is there I go right now you're on top but let's see how about we have a little competition and see who's on top in a year from now and all I did is see this little like spark in like Matt's eyes and I was just like <laughs> 
Job complete. I like just, <laughs> that's just like, let's see who's done one in one year. Just to be like a troublemaker, even though, by the way, I, I don't particularly pay for one pair or another. I'm not trying to do that. But like, I just thought like, that's a little bit of dissent and see how this plays out. And I just like slid back. So it's, all, it's all your fault. That's, that's the thing. Indirectly, the message yeah. At the end. yeah. <laughs> message at the end. It's, it's all, all your fault. fault. Like, My, I remember for like three years... Every time anything wrong happened, Yanko just would say at the no matter what it was, Yanko at the end would just go, yeah, and then Moses bombed my country. And then I was the, the guy in the fucking... <laughs> yeah, you know what? That actually, since he's not here, by the way, it'd be funny. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. Before he comes back. <laughs> we, we used to think that was Fuck a joke. I'm not joking. We used to think when he said that, that he was just like using hyperbole. Like, yeah, and then they bombed my country or whatever. Yeah, Yanko... Yeah. Yanko, you're going to appreciate this. We were just about to tell a story about your background, which is like Jason was mentioned about how you would always end like you would always end shit stories like uh, with like, and that's when Jason bombed my country. And what I was saying to Jason, though, that people don't know though, is we used to actually think that you were joking. Like I thought that that was hyperbole. Like, oh, I'm sure you know maybe he lived like maybe it was on the other side of the country. You get bombed. Like I'll give you the best example now. Is obviously there's been all this like uprising in the Ukraine for the last like we're talking like three or four years at this point. Yeah, in time. but. You can still go to Star Series events and you never see any problems because, you know, it didn't reach as far as Ukraine. So I mm. thought that that's what it was like in Serbia when Yanko was a kid. I didn't know that it was real, that, you know, like he was getting bombed and stuff. So when he used to say that all the time, like, yeah, and then, of course, then Jason's people just bombed my family. And then I remember I one mean, time is, I had to run a for a bomb. in the sense that I didn't do the actual bombing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It did happen, like, though. It well, did they weren't happen. flying the plane, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I made well, the order, right? To be fair, Jason, you weren't out there in fucking... At the Washington Monument protesting against it, though, were you? So yeah, you were complicit. The time. Yeah. I could have done way more. <laughs> you were complicit. Where were you in the peace process? <laughs> and who did your dad vote for in that election? <laughs> if, uh, when we're putting all our cards I on the table. I, I wish I knew that before I met him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking hell. Yeah, that was, no. uh, that was always funny. Yeah, but no, I, I really enjoy that. I really enjoy... Uh, poking fun at Jason because he thinks it's no big deal. You know, it's just like something that someone over there did, but whatever. They don't it's, teach that shit in our not, schools. Why does this have to take well, a dump? They don't they teach really you don't. a lot of things really like don't. geography for first that been on YouTube knows, but well, yeah, you're from Siberia, right? Yeah, exactly. It's that's my favorite part when I do makeup like somewhere in the U S where are you from Serbia? Oh, it's so cold there. Right. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. That's why, I'm so, <laughs> that, that's why I'm so pale, you know, can't you tell? I, and they're like, oh, you poor thing. How does it feel to be in California? Amazing. I love in and out Here's one thing, though, that is an underrated <laughs> Please, thing. Please, let, let me go The makeup now. comment just reminded me of, like, a fucking racy story. I don't know if I should tell this. No, one. listen. The I, Minsk I, I one. The Minsk one. We the obviously Minsk can't one. tell the certain Minsk elements court. of that. But, no, but I was about to get to that. One thing that people I'll don't know it, about... I'll tell if you don't want to. Yeah, sure. One thing that people... <laughs> yeah, because whether to translate is fucking... One brilliant. thing people don't know about Yanko is that, okay, obviously he isn't, like, fully fluent in Russian, but he knows some Russian. Like, he can understand basic things people are saying. But because he's from Serbia, people who speak Russian and actually just assume he won't know any Russian at all and they think, oh, we can just speak whatever we want. So, like, it mm -hmm. goes without saying, for example, when I'm around, they're all just shit-talking me non-stop in Russian, like, because I'm just a, bit, just a cunt and they just hear me swearing all the time and being rude or whatever. But, like, the problem is they do that when Yanko's around. They don't know that he's actually, like, listening to what they're saying. So, was this the story you were thinking of, Yanko? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I'll tell this story. I'm fine this with it. Great because, story. But I need to preface it with the fact that, you know, people from Eastern Europe, like, our culture is just different you know it's not as open as the west like i gotta say this like even you know racially it's pretty like uh not monotonous but mono homogenous homogenous yeah, homogenous exactly that's the word i'm looking for so this is the thing event in minsk star series 2016 you know still early on with events and so on and so on we come into the makeup room and you know, the girls are obviously all like just speaking between themselves in Russian. They don't know I understand Russian. We're all talking in English. We're talking a lot of shit and so on and so on. Because by and, the way, just to, and, just as an aside, and, for people who don't know, when you're getting makeup done, I know if you're a normal person, you think, oh, I'm sure you listen to the person and talk to the makeup person. You don't because you get it done every day. So what you do is mm -hmm. you act as though they're not there and you talk to whoever's with you who's talent, you know. And unfortunately, if you make up, that means you just sometimes even hear conversations that like you would never be privy to normally, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you, and people talk shit and so on and so on. But James and Dan were doing this event. So 
on like day one basically of the of the show when we're doing makeup <laughs> <laughs> Moses just caught on I know <laughs> I, I, I was there I was there I was coming oh. in one you know one of the other guys and so on is coming on and like you know it's James's turn to get makeup <laughs> And the girl like uh, makes a comment in Russian to her other girl is like, well, what the fuck am I supposed to use on this guy? <laughs> you know. <laughs> By the way, the implication obviously just being that she's never dealt with someone who like, exactly. didn't have white skin that color. The, it's not. It, it wasn't supposed to be like overtly racist. No, the problem no. is, if that's all she you just, heard, it sounds she, like yeah, that. Doesn't she it? just, she just, I, and for of me, course, it wasn't yeah. that bad because I understood where she was coming yes. from. She never had to like work with a person of darker skin, right? Because Put it this way, when he told exactly. us the story though, it was the equivalent to like, if someone had been drinking in a glass of orange juice, it would have just shot out their nose as he told us the story. Like, so, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this guy? Like, yeah. holy shit, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? But this is like, the end part is really good though, because, so this is the thing that I did. The whole event, I didn't tell them I understood Russian. I didn't say a word of Russian. I didn't do anything. I waited for the after party. So the after party comes in, of course, all the people who are working the event are there as well, you know. And uh, I come to, because I can understand Russian, but I can't speak it that well. I, I, I cannot, like, you know. So I come to one of the guys who was working for Star Series, and I am tell him, like, listen, these are the three or four sentences I want to say. Please, like, tell me how I need to say it so it sounds perfectly. So the makeup girls were all, like, sticking together, three or four of them at the event. So I walk up to them, and in, like, you know, perfect Russian, I say, hey, what's up? Like, you know, thank you so much for, like, uh, making us as, as uh, pretty as you can, like, during the whole event. Like, really appreciate it. And, you know, it's been a pleasure working with you. And all of their jaws are just like this. Because it's not just the, the, the James thing that they said. They were talking so much shit about pretty much every single one of us, you know, Duncan is so loud. He's like talking so much. He's just fuck, fuck, fuck every other word that comes out of his if mouth. If you don't understand the English, I can totally understand that. That is what you would just hear, right? <laughs> if I'm talking, this fucking gun is a fucking piece of shit. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So and they're just like, oh, you, you understand Russian? And I'm like, yeah, a little bit. You know, like the the, the important stuff is what I said. So that was just hilarious. You know, I was just. Telling them, yeah, you're, yo, don't worry about it, you know. You're fucking underselling yourself because in St. Petersburg, we were out. You're well, like, the, the, like the thing is, this was a, a matter of life and death. If you're gonna tell the cab story, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I <laughs> so I, you're I happy, you were really motivated. I was I was pretty drunk at the time, but I mean, it you were wasn't nothing new there. Apparently, you, you, were, you, were, show. you were also <laughs> you were also Canadian that evening. Yeah, yeah. So we 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 ordered an Uber to go out to like a bar or a club or something at like after dinner or something along those lines. And um, he he, up, he he rolls up and he just like the first thing he says when he looks out the window, we're like, all right, yeah, we're going here. And he's like, all right, none of you are American, right? And I'm like, nope, Canadian, <laughs> Canadian for sure. Um, and we get in this car and it's like, I forget who's next to me, but Yanko's in the front seat and Yanko is just having a conversation with this guy full on Russian the whole time. Um, but like the thing is when you go to Russia, like you see, we've all seen those videos of like the Russian driving videos on YouTube. Of yes. All the accidents and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I thought like to a certain degree, I thought that was like the most extreme examples, but we've gotten this Uber or this cab or whatever the fuck it was. And this motherfucker is insane. He's going up on sidewalks around red lights. He's going up into like lanes that don't exist when people crazy taxi style. Like, yeah, no, literally, it was like playing. Wait, what? Yeah, taxi. this is also oh, the thing. In, in, in Saint Petersburg, it's on the on, on the river and on the sea, so there's a lot of bridges and a lot of canals. So at some point, right. the bridges the bridges go up the race, so you can't go yeah. over them anymore. You have to circle around all the way. So this guy was trying to get ahead of that. He was really trying to get ahead of that. <laughs> it was fucked up, dude. It was, no, he was trying to like beat the timing of when the bridges go up so he didn't have to like drive us like on a massive fucking detour. So he's going like 60 miles an hour on like a 40 mile an hour road, going through red lights, going on sidewalks, weaving between cars. And Yanko the whole time is just chatting with him in Russian. And I, I don't know what was said, but I just was sitting there and I was like, I don't want to die here in Russia. Here Yanko was just saying in Russian, like, faster, let's like, show this pussy Yankee <laughs> pig dog what this Europe's all about, homie. Let's show him how we drive here. The best thing was the driver was Ukrainian. 
Mate, so that's the most. This is this makes is the most, all the difference. <laughs> this is the most fascinating thing to me. One thing I've I've like noticed as as an American, like first of all, with all the there's travels, all these um, other countries in the world that we haven't <laughs> bombed yet. Uh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, so many opportunities out there. <laughs> Um, why do they hit us? We keep them safe with all our bases in their country. And all. <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> it's a weird world, isn't it, Just I, I find it hard I to do. understand, yeah. I do come to realize as an American when I've done so much traveling is that like things are not I mean, this is this is obvious and I kind of knew this ahead of time, just not the extent is like things are definitely not the way that it's portrayed to us as Americans, whether it's in school or whether it's in, in, in news. Um, but But one of the things that's always stuck out to me is the fact that I, I didn't even like necessarily realize this fully is Ukraine is in like a civil war for like two years now, aren't yes. they? And it's yeah. like, whenever we go to Kiev, I don't notice a thing. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, that's the thing. Well, it's the country. Exactly. here's where I will have something to say about that, but I will not do it, Jason. He doesn't know if he's going to be working Star Series again, right? Okay, so no, that's on no, the table. No, 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 okay. nothing about Star Series, something about certain uh, venues in Kiev and so on. No, but it is it is so amazing to me how I can go to Kiev and like go out and have like a nice dinner or go out to a drink and like you don't even realize like the political and like those those kind of ramifications were like not to make this like super serious at the moment, but like it is one of the things that has always struck me is like I know like I'll, I'll just say this because he, he won't care. I mean, it's, it's just my dad, but I remember going to Dubai in 2015 and he was just like, no, you can't go to the Middle East. Like, I don't want you going to the Middle East. And it's like, it's like son, I can't see you on one of those videos. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, yeah. Right. No, he, but I had that happen too. That, I right? had that happen too with my parents. Yeah. And, and it's, and it was just like this weird thing where like, once I got to Dubai, like I didn't have any issues. Um, obviously Ukraine in a civil war, I've never had any issues. And it's, it's this weird thing where it's like the, I've noticed this in every country I've gone to is the average citizen in every single country, um, doesn't give a fuck about like political things going on. Like he, they might have some preconceptions, but they're all nice people. Right? Like, so it's, it's this very weird, weird thing where like, I go into it thinking like, oh, I have to be super safe in Dubai. And I mean, you're always aware of your surroundings and aware of what's going on around you, but I've never felt in danger anywhere I've went, you know? <laughs> right. Along these lines, I've got, I, you've just made me remember a great story but I'll crucially protect the identity of one of the people in this story. So yeah. when we did the first ever DreamHack Masters event, it's exactly like this because it was in Malmo, right? Yes. And yeah. Malmo, which is in the south of Sweden, famously is the area which if you if you follow uh, like modern politics is the one they always try to claim if they're not from Sweden. It's like, it's a war zone and, you know, like it's all like, you know, no man's land and you can't go there. Like you'll get killed by all the, like, you know, the criminals know, and know all these people. Uh, yeah, so what happens I was, right, is. obviously we're all hoping like Jason here, oh, that's just overblown, you know, I'm sure it's a lovely place, you know. So we're at the event and someone who is from Sweden keeps telling us, yeah, don't go to the after party. You're going to get shot. I'm not lying. Some people are going to take guns. They're going to shoot people. If you go there, you will get shot. And we're going like, dude, stop fucking with us. Like, obviously we're going to this after party, you know, it's a sick event. And he's going, listen, I'm telling you, I'm not going. And we're going... You see, and we're asking other people, like, is he overselling this? Like, come on, there's no way people are shooting us, right? And all I'm going to say is this. We're going to the after party in the taxi, right? And and this is no word of a lie. As I am pulling up to where the after party is and the Uber driver guy's like, yeah, it's up here. He points to a building that is shaped in that, that architectural style of the Taj Mahal. I go inside and they themed the rooms to be bomb sites. And I'm just going like, is this an actual simulation? And this is some mad <laughs> surreal way in which I die at the end of this fucking movie as someone actually detonates a device inside. Was this guy right all along? Obviously, the actual end of the story is no one did get shot. One of the most epic after parties after you've person, ever had. Yes. Yes. But, that, awesome. but, that, but that person who said that did not for real come to the after party. No, he didn't. Yeah, that's right. They, By the way, I remember I flew from Stockholm with you, Semler, at that event. Mm -hmm. Um from Stockholm to to Copenhagen, then we, we took the shuttle across the bridge. But when we were on the train from from like downtown Stockholm to the airport, they have those like uh, TV screens and they have like the news alerts that flash up. And one of the news alerts was mm -hmm. the mayor, the mayor of Malmo is criticized for not cracking down hard enough on ISIS. <laughs> it was just like, oh, so this is where we're going. Like we'd heard all those stories. Yeah. From and then I saw that news Not ticker and I'm like, I'm like, oh boy, here we go. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to be Malmo, but here we are. That whole venue, that whole thing, that was, it, we, we get those every now and again, right? We get those events that are like, hmm. 
But um, almost, that was the one I think the most, where it went the most, where it's just like, I was hearing the I, most of like, don't go to the after party, don't like just chill, like da 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 da. It I'm turned out totally to, fine, obviously, at the end. I'm yeah, because a, very few of us would say no to free booze. So. I mean, true. <laughs> very true. That was also a bad. That was that was DJ Duncan fucking dropping mad sets. Of course, um, that was a mad after party. Yeah. That was a sick yeah. after. That was one of the so best we ever had. They, I remember Dream. Yeah, Dreamhack. So just to explain it, Dreamhack went to all the commentators afterwards, and they were like, "Does anyone want to do like a DJ set at the after party? We're gonna have like a side room where like uh, casters and players come up and do a DJ set." And I think it was it was what Duncan, Henry, and Machine. Yes, all and showed up well. to have. Yeah, I, I closed the night. I had I had a very chill. I was I was way too drunk at that point to to really. Re- yeah, that's the thing. Story. The room had kind of emptied, but then yeah. I was I was like, ah, well, let's bring it down. Let's bring so it down. So Henry kicked it off, and he did like his UK punk, and I like yeah. showed up late. I showed Hold up like, three songs in, and I came in. And there's like a fucking mosh pit. Henry's got like his like wireless mic, and he's in the middle of the crowd going fucking <laughs> yeah. wild. He's, he's fucking metal. sweating, dude. He was nuts. He we basically up- acted as though, like, uh, like what they really told him was, like, oh, uh, Henry, you know, pick some songs and do a DJ set. He thought what they said was, be Iggy Pop for a night. And he <laughs> yeah. was just out there, like, fucking, Dude, like, getting the crowd to chant was- shit, like, getting carried across Wait, their arms. Wasn't that, like, wasn't that when he broke his heel? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. At yeah. one point, though, at one point yeah, during yeah. his set, he's literally just screaming, everyone, dance with Sonicist. And people are just dancing aggressively, grinding <laughs> on the Sonicist <laughs> really in aggressive. the middle of a crowd. You know, like, he was not even part of the show, right? Yeah. And then, yeah, as, you, as you're yeah, referencing, at and the end of it, got his foot broken or something, right? Yeah, he's, yeah, he missed his fight the next day. He fucking stayed in his hotel room. He was, he was like, guys, I can't he was, he was crowd surfing and landed awkwardly on his ankle. And yeah, he got out of bed and just couldn't walk. So he, missed, <laughs> he had to stay like an extra like six hours or something until it swelled down. But I mean, that... Then there was Duncan set, which was a nice casual drum and bass. In the <laughs> Aggressive as fuck <laughs> drum and bass. Yes. That I cranked to the max as well. <laughs> what, were you, what were you saying as long as you had the mic and you were and I, going bashing. And because, because this was the era when this particular catchphrase had just caught on, I was sort of live mixing oh, in yeah. over the mix. Brutal, savage, wrecked as all like as though I had like another like vinyl of it, and I was like a DJ. But in reality, it was just me saying it on the mic, like just doing the red eye of brutal, savage, wrecked over and over again. Fucking hell, that's right, I remember. Because you have to understand. Dur- by the way, the context that we forgot to add is during these DJ sets to keep everyone hyped. The people who owned the club just kept bringing trays of like tequila shooters around. So, tequila so by the time, like for example, like I'd even finished my set, I'd probably had like oh, five or six of them myself. So everyone was just completely trashed at this party. Twenty minute DJ set. I think that was the first time I really saw you like blitz. Like I really, out, I was out with them bit. Like because you get there, your eyes you just get like narrower and narrower. And that was the first time where I saw you. I was just like, what the fuck? Like Duncan is. Tongue is lit. I was gone. <laughs> All you need to know is that was one of the events where when I woke up, I didn't have my court. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, right, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to go on to my a, YouTube videos you know, in this coat? What am, am I, I going to do now? Am I, like, I going to really call up a nightclub at like 11 in the morning when my flight's in two hours? Or am I going to go home and then write them and ask for my court? And I went, no, I have lost that court. That is the end of that court. <laughs> Goodbye. Farewell. Time to buy a new court. I have money now. You know? So that court's probably still in some cloakroom there. And they're like, it's weird. No one ever came to pick this one up. <laughs> yeah. And now some bouncers wearing it, you know? Hey. Let's, uh, let's do this. I was wondering this earlier. Um Let's do, let's walk through. I know Yanko and I have the same one, but moments that you guys realized that you were going to actually make it in an esports career. Like the moment that like it triggered in your brain of like this. Cause I know we all, I, I know, I know I have a snapshot and I think I know Yanko does, but of that moment where like kind of like really clicks that like, holy shit, this is going to be a long term thing. Fuck. Uh, um, I have two of them. Okay. Uh, because the first one was Dreamhack Summer when I first cast a BLC and I met James and and I realized like whatever I have to do, I'm gonna be a part of this. Because Dreamhack was I'll awesome. suck any dicks that I need to. <laughs> I just need to be part of this business. I'll suck the dick. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he phrase it like that? Though most like I'll do whatever I had to do to be part I know, of this. I know, dude. Wait, what I, you said, have, just to be clear, this guys, thing? this isn't editing out any of my story. This no, is, no. you know, yeah, the camera just uh, yeah, Yanko dropped, and we, we are a... editing out the the dick sucking. No, no. <laughs> that's not <laughs> so, uh, Jason got into the tricast, so let's move on. Exactly. Let me see. <laughs> two of them, two of them, two of them. Um, 
I guess two of them. And the worst thing is, as he was doing unders, someone was just screaming, that's so sick! Oh, he must be sweating bullets for my dick! (laughs) (laughs) Where the fuck are we going with this? Anyway, keep going. What was the story, yeah? That was moment one. What was moment two? No, no, uh, fuck off. Fuck off, Duncan. So, (laughs) moment moment one. Moment one was, uh, moment one was VMAX Summer, the finals, BLC tournament. People had shown up for the finals, which already was like, I was like, holy shit, because we're a small game at the venue. Um, and we we fucking killed it. Great finals, great cast. Met James, met most of the people at DreamHack in terms of like who actually worked for DreamHack. And I was just like, cool, this is where I want to be. And this is like, I'll do, haha, I'll do whatever I can do. Similar to means part of too good there, by the way, not, not yeah, James Bardolph. Just so no, absolutely play. not. Yeah. Uh, too good. So, um, and for any of you, you know, we'll never work with him again. That, that, that too good. So, um, so that was the first moment where I was just like, all right, there's a chance here. And then DreamHack winner the following months later, that's when we came up with the idea for the good studio. And that's when I was just like, oh, okay, I bought a one-way ticket to Sweden. And I was like, that's it. Let's go. So I was like one moment where I was like, all right, this is a thing. And this could be, this could be possible. And then obviously the second one, I think pretty evident to everybody is when um, I met Andrews um, for streaming. Cause when, cause I had an idea of what I wanted to do with commentary. I had an idea of like what was possible and very luckily Anders and I aligned on, on what we wanted to do and where we wanted to go and what, what needed to happen. And so when we cast it together, we had a long conversation afterwards. And I think it was at the end of that conversation afterwards. And I've said this in the past in other, in other talks and whatnot, where it's just like, you need to, you need to get, a, you need to like get along the guy you're co-commentating with because you need to you need to have the same sense of humor you need to get you need to be able to like have a beer with the guy and shoot the shit and so we casted and then we must have spoken for like three hours to hear about random shit and at the end of that conversation i was like we're in we're cool this is gonna be good and we're gonna go and that was um yeah that was the beginning of anders and i so i think those are like the two key moments where it all kind of crystallized where it's like there's a the, like this is where we can go okay what would your what would your choice be, Yanko? What was the moment that it kicked in for you? Well, what Jason referenced is what I have on my wallpaper on my phone is from the Dubai event in 2015. There was like a, a view from the hotel or something like that. It looked really cool. And for me, it wasn't the moment that I thought like I, I can make it in esports. It was the moment that I figured out like shit. This thing is like giving me some really cool opportunities and like. You know, this is just like, it's amazing to be a part of this, but what probably made me realize like, um, you know, I can make it in esports or like this can be like an actual career um, was Columbus to an extent, but for real, it was probably Cologne that same year. So Cologne 2016 um, as an event where I did every single game of the tournament as an analyst, including the final uh, in that, obviously, as we already mentioned, like amazing arena and an amazing venue. So when I did that, I thought like, yeah, this is something like, you know, th- that's a goal that I set for myself for 2016 was to do like Cologne as an analyst and possibly do like the grand final as well. So once I achieved that, I thought like, yeah, this is where, you know, I really broke through and now I just need to keep grinding. I mean, I, I made like a good spot for myself and I just need to keep at it and I can, you know, uh, continue with this and, and keep having like these opportunities. There, there is like a tipping point, isn't there? There, Like (laughs) where you're just like, you realize that there's, there like the moment crystallizes and you're just like, huh? Okay. Maybe there is a chance, you know, because before that it's just floundering before that you're kind of just like, you know, this is awesome. This is great. But you know, is this just a hobby? Is this just whatever? Like when I when I bought that first Dream Act ticket, I was literally putting all of my savings into it, and, and like my mindset was just like, either something comes of this, or I just had a fucking awesome week in Sweden. And it's just a vacation, and I go back to my fucking job, and there you go. But that that was like my mindset going into it, right? Where all all or nothing, kind of just fuck around, have fun. Yeah, I mean, my moment, as Yanko said, it was it was from Dubai. It's what I alluded to, where af- after the event, we had like. A bunch of Twitch guys, or like two or three Twitch guys, had come to the event as well, and they got God into bless rooms. the Twitch people. Yeah, God bless. <laughs> Big bless them. Um, them. And they they'd oh they'd all gotten their rooms upgraded. So there were like three Twitch guys there, and they each had their own room, and all three of them got upgraded, and all three of them got upgraded to suites that had like 
three bedrooms, two bathrooms, <coughs> kitchen, living room, over in a balcony overlooking the marina. So I, I very much remember distinctly like being in this being in this um, this high rise hotel overlooking the Dubai Marina. Um, Yanko was there, obviously. Anders was there. I think Sumler was away at that event. You didn't do Dubai that year. Yeah, I wasn't there for that one. Um, and we just all been having like a drink. I was just having a drink on the balcony, basically by myself, and looking over this. And I was with Anders, and I just I just looked over. And I was just like, how do you like capture this feeling? You know, like, how do you capture this feeling that like you're on, everything's positive. You're on the run. And then underscores, just jump. It's a simulation <laughs> anyway. Dubai was a good one, but our great one is Sydney because of the same reason, right? Like yeah. even for, for Americans or, or Brits who are the majority of the talent crew is, is still mm -hmm. a destination. You wouldn't really go to, you know, like, if it weren't for an esports event being there. So like, especially for me going to places like that, you know, going to Brazil, going to China, all these different parts of the world, like you really appreciate the opportunity you got thanks to esports to like travel all over the world and experience all these cultures and people and everything like that. So yeah. I think it's like probably one of the coolest aspects of our job is that we get to to see all these places and travel all over the world for sure. Uh, one moment for me that always and it's not like a big event. It's not a it's not it was just like a moment where I was like just happy. Really, really, really fucking happy. Was uh, uh, at uh, Overwatch World Cup? Fuck off. So it was at, <laughs> that's when he knew I mean, he'd made it and you know he finally felt like he'd found his calling, Jesus people who respected hey, him. Hey, appreciate you guys knock it, but Barclays, that was a fucking thick event. It was one of the best events I bonkers yeah. fans there were sick but I, you aside, were only the second most talented person on stage after dj khaled <laughs> he's dj khaled <laughs> all right so um no, and ironically but, you also don't eat pussy <laughs> <laughs> he's a millennial he eats ass i'm done i'm out <laughs> what were you gonna say anyway yeah what about back <laughs> fucking hell this is the problem with del telling stories around duncan it's just like you're, you're just gonna get the commentary that cuts in and just fucks with your whole storyline um no no i mean it's a wholesome thing it's just it's just it was just um swc montreal and we were all uh we were all in that fucking massive hotel together like way up and it was sato's room balcony and for whatever reason i can't remember i like we never found out what the reason was but uh, we had this sick view of the city and then all of a sudden there was just like these massive fireworks massive fucking fireworks going off and so it must have been some kind of you know celebration i don't know what it was probably should have found out but um, it was just like being there with everybody on this balcony and just watching these fireworks go off really close, like boom, massive fireworks all over the city. And I was just like, man, this is this is this is really sick. Like this is pretty fucking cool that we're all able to be here and and like do this and be here together and and have a good time, you know, and just like see these things. Um, Which, uh, by the way, is impressive considering that event was an absolute dumpster. That fire. event, yes, the event itself. That's why there was nothing special about that event. That event was a dumpster fire of epic proportion. Fucking nuts. That was when Simple, uh, he, that was when Hiko was yeah, saying yeah, flip side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he had, was there for flip side. I was casting with Fifth. And we had that. Yeah, I was casting with Fifth. And we had that ridiculous, like, Cloud9 Envy game, right? Where both that was when the French right. shuffle was known, but yeah. it hadn't happened yeah. yet. So exactly. the Envy players knew they were kicked out already. So they purposely, like, half through the game. And, yeah. No, exactly. was, that, that event was a fucking dumpster fire. But. But everything outside the event, you know, like going to the bars in downtown Montreal with everybody and, and like being up in that high rise, getting to watch that fireworks show, like all of that came together. And it's just like, holy shit, this is rad. Like, this is really cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just like wholesome. It just felt like really good. Uh, that's probably one of my fondest memories. Duncan, give us a wholesome moment. Reach yeah, come on, Duncan. That, that oh, I've got one for Grinch heart of yours. <clears throat> so obviously mine isn't when I realized I could make a career out of esports because I've been grinding the motherfucker for about <laughs> three half decades before we even get to this story. But, but at least the moment I realized like in terms of like on camera casting type stuff, I could have a career and it could go beyond just doing the odd event, you know, is that in 2015, which is the year everyone knows CS started to blow up and we went from like, I always tell this story. In 2014, I think I worked 
looking at four events. And then in 2015, it was like 17. So you can see the difference in terms of like how many events now, like every event in 2015 had an analyst desk and had analysts. But crucially yeah. at the time, there weren't analysts. It was like me and Richard were the main analysts. And then it, they would put casters. So people like you, Semler, you would come on the desk. Obviously, Moses started to come to the European events. But aside from that, it was just a mixed bag of people on the desk. Like there was no Yanko. He was an observer at the time. Obviously, all the ex-pro people, Sean Gez, they were all still playing at the time. So there wasn't like a big scene of analysts. And when we did the event, you'll remember this summer, that was DreamHack London. And this was the no. event that was in the same arena that they'd had the Gfinity. It was that Copper Box Arena. And the yeah. problem this event had was it didn't really sell out many tickets. Like it was like very sparse, like crowd there. And a lot of the top teams skipped it. Like the main two teams there, the good teams were Envious and TSM who played in the final. And that was a very good match. Well, that's but the aside from that, that's yes, the yes, list. that's exactly the tournament. Yeah, but aside from that, though, a lot of the tournament field was like fairly weak. You know, it was like like London. It was like London conspiracy or LGB yeah. or something. One of the Norwegian teams and Copenhagen Wolves, which was like I think a Danish team still. Like the like the lineups were a mess all over the place. So the actual event. This is the key part of the story. The context. The event itself wasn't good. Like it wasn't a hype crowd. Wasn't a great spectacle of an event. And ninety nine percent of the games, except the final, were just shit. Like they were really bad games. Games. as in like bad game and people don't care about it and it's two teams that you don't care about seeing but like no no redeeming qualities so as a result this was an event where me and Richard just like pushed the pedal to the floor metaphorically of like just going pure banter like everything was just jokes and but it's like where a lot of the clips actually that yeah. people put in those like highlight videos of me are from like the one where for example I come up and this is a this is a real segment I come up and I'm like like you know like like using like a tissue on my brow, like, oh, Richard, oh, the Fox fans, they beat me up. Or so, you know, like all the like lame skits like that are in this particular event, right? And the reason why this is a great memory for me is because what I realized was that was when I actually crystallized my formula that you don't just banter for no reason. Because before that, I used to banter because, you know, it's just an interesting moment or a funny thing to say. But I realized you could actually use it as a formula. Like the shit of the game is no one's going to care about that game. No one wants to hear analysis of that game. That's when people want to hear it. Some fun or make a joke about the game or have some interplay between the people on the desk. And what I realized in that moment was okay, people could come along who know the game way better than me. People could come along who could kill me in terms of analyzing the game or doing this. But if if, if I could like make that my specialty, because at the time it was just a side byproduct to who I was, you know, if I make that my specialty, then I'll always have like my own little niche in the community, basically. And obviously other people can do that as well, but it's always been kind of like my little niche. And that was where I feel like I started to get a handle on actually like figuring it out. So it wasn't like... Mm -hmm haphazard you know like sometimes he says because for example what i then the key thing i learned from that was not only should you use it for when the game is shit but as we alluded to earlier in the show don't bother doing it if it's a really important game like if it's a big semi or a final unless it's something outrageously hilarious just keep it like serious like that's supposed to be like there's supposed to be a, an air of gravitas about a big final it's supposed to be something you know you go watching history it's a big moment you don't want people joking around that often in that case you know true uh, that, that'll be my moment i think yeah. By the way, I'll give you credit here, Sam. I'll give you an assist on this one. In this event, because as I said, they used to, since we used to have four man desks, they used to just put whichever casters weren't casting at the time on the desk. So, like Henry and Sadakis to come on, right? When Semler and Anders came on, as is my way, obviously, I was just tossing loads of jabs at Anders the whole time, like about his weight, about looking like shit, being a nerd, and all, you know, all the normal stuff, the usual <laughs> buttons you press with Anders. And here's what I'll give credit to Semler. Semler <laughs> also understands the concept of on-camera personality and having some fun. Because during a, a, a when we had a break, Semla actually turned to me on one of these desks and he goes, fire some of those over here. It's like, because he didn't want to just be stood there saying nothing while everyone was just roasting under. So he actually, he welcomed the banter. That was back in the days, some of the way. If you remember, every comment on forums used to be like, you can tell Anders really hates Thorin. Yeah, because like, it. You know, exactly. when, when Thorin's roasting him, there's sort of a look in his eye like he wants to kill him, but he just doesn't say it. It's like they just, they went so deep reading Anders' brain, which by the way, I hope you've now figured out, no one can read. That's like, you need that like, to Rosetta Stone for that. Like, look at that guy, what a wreck he is. <laughs> Do you want... Have, I, have we all done our moment then? Those were those were the times. Those were those were those were fucking mad times. Yeah, those were good. Times. Yeah, I think we've had our moment. Should we end it on that? Should we? I mean, we don't have to. Does anyone have anything else? Does anyone else have anything else? I did. I did, I did so a second, Eddie, Eddie, 
I think Cluj Napoca was like a special Cluj, event. Cluj was a really cool. Major All right, here we go. There's that a few was, stories from this one. I'll I mean, tell you this. There's a few stories, but I, this no, is here's, here's a good one. It really brought us all together in terms of talent. Yeah, well, that so was the, the first event that all the talent at the time, all the top talent, got together except yeah. for Yanko. Yes, Yanko for was major, there. at least. Yeah, Yanko I was, was almost there. there. I think it was no. I, I came there to visit because it's so close to Serbia. I drove there with two of my friends, with Kasad actually, yeah. and one more friend of ours. But I came close to doing that event as an analyst. Even uh, Mark from DreamHack almost hired me, and I think it would have been instead of you, Jason, because what he told me was. One person I have, I'm having trouble oh, I'm negotiating sorry, them. They're they're asking for too much or something like that. So at that time, Jason wasn't negotiating. Narrow it down a bit more. <laughs> no, Jason. <laughs> Jason was negotiating for himself. It was ESCA, like right, okay. for him. So I think sure. like. Yeah. So I think Mark was maybe like a time, but eventually like they got down to it. And to be fair, like I was super inexperienced at that time. Like it wasn't realistic for me to show up at the major. Like. Um, you know, so I, I was like, when he told me about it the first time, I wasn't like expecting anything to come out of it. But yeah, like that was a funny story because I thought I, I thought it was like from what he told me, like that's what I understood it was. It was like I just came there and still had fun with the guys because, f interestingly enough, it was before that event where the World Championships happened, and that was where I got to yes. meet Duncan and Richard and uh, Scott, like Sir Scoots, for the for the first just time. So I still felt like I could come there and you know, uh, talk to the guys at the very least. Just to give some perspective as well, because that's that's the funny part about it is I remember that event. That's the one where I've, I've referenced in an AMA um, where Anders and Simler, I think each took a thousand off their off their rate for the event to to get me in. I think we each, we each took half of our rate. Yeah, so, something like yeah. that. I don't know yeah, the exact amount of things. Almost so. I, I, that's I why know, I meant by I'm sorry, Yanko, because I I wasn't aware of this. <laughs> you know, but like there was. But yeah, but you guys didn't no, get solid for Columbus, so we're all good. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not even that. It was. I remember that event. Just to, just to talk about how far we've come is. I think my rate for that event. I think I got twenty. Don't talk. Don't say it. Too late. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, I think I got like twenty five like, for the whole that's week. Like, that's like Duncan's day rate nowadays. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I mean that—that's just how far we've we've grown as an industry, which is which is pretty cool. But I mean, no, I think Not I enough. think people are when when. <laughs> when <laughs> <laughs> but I think people have this like idea that like we're all we're all part of this cabal. I, I noticed this and this this pisses me off. This is one of my trigger points is when we get accused of like collusion to keep people out is like I think all of us can have a story of when one of uh one of us in the group helped someone get get a gig. You know, just to get started. Like I know Anders and someone helped me. Anders and someone probably helped everyone to a certain degree um get some kind of a job. But even even these days when I'm asked by smaller events like like the iBuy powers, like like the the random one off events in North America, who they should hire and who were or when Blast asks us who we should who they who they should look at as a as a hire. Um and we we always give them names that are relatively unheard of. As, you know, at least I do. I know Duncan does. I know sure, Anderson yeah. Semler do. We all give them those kind of like off off the cuff names that people don't normally see. Um, you know, by the way, we've you all just had this conversation, except, except for Mega Man. Of course, yeah. We all just agree that that's in our contracts that he can never work any of the events. Yeah, right? Right. All, all but within two hundred. I mean, minutes. we even had that like meeting at Blast where everyone was there. We did the whole hand raising thing. It was uh, yes. encapsulated on Twitter. Shout out, well. Duncan! Thanks for that. Yeah. Oh my God! Yes. All right. By the way, speaking of, way, I can't believe we haven't brought this up because this is something that should have been said at the beginning of the episode to really give the context of what these green rooms are like. <clears throat> but in British drinking culture, there is a famous thing you do, right? Which is if you're all out and you're all drinking, and two of your mates start to get really in each other's faces, like they're about to have like a pawn shop, you know, like one of them say, "Like, oh, what the fuck are you saying to me? I'm sick of your shit," you know. What you do is you really sarcastically say, "Well, still all mates, though, right?" And you go, "Still all mates," because the problem <laughs> all is, all mates, of course. Since you are all friends, you're all required to sort of go like begrudging, like, yeah, I guess so, fuck that guy. But the problem is, obviously, the real joke there is like, clearly they're not mates. Like, they want to kill each other, you know. So me and Henry actually did introduce that exact saying to the green rooms. So that what you do is whenever, like, say, like, Sadikist and Chad or someone are just going mad at each other, you just wait until, like, the moment it's hit, it's like emotional peak where they're really mad, and then you just go, 
Still all mates, though, right? Still all mates. And then obviously they're just looking at you like, no, I fucking hate the guy. Like, <laughs> There's a, definitely not. Definitely not. Definitely. Well, that was the classic one. I actually did that myself, which was one time I was having, I forget what event this was. I was having like an argument, believe it or not, with Anders. So I don't think I've ever argued with my entire life. And I was arguing with him over the fact that like, to me, the Valve devs are completely useless and they never listen to anything you say. And oh. They just listen to, listen to you in like offhand conversations at majors, which, you know, they're never going to remember that conversation. Is that during my question 2014? I think it was after this, but this is the, no, that, no, not the one where we met the devs. I mean, when we were just talking about this, like me and okay, Anders were okay. talking about the fact that the devs are useless and Anders goes, that's not true at all. They've implemented lots of things I suggested. And I was like, like what? And then he goes, you know, when you throw smoke, that line follows the smoke. And I go, what are you talking about? Who gives a fuck about a fucking line that like follows the smoke? I'm talking about the guns and the balance of the game, you daft cunt. And then, out, and then, and then the best thing is, right? It was someone like, it might have been Semler. Or it was either Semler or someone like that was walking by and they just go, still all mates though. And I go, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> just because in that moment, I was so triggered, you know, it's like, no, oh, fuck this guy. <laughs> fuck him to the end of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, so, that's so true. We still use it to this day. It's because it's so perfect, isn't it? Like, the, 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 what's great is it sounds like you're being a really encouraging guy when you say it, but you're actually just adding more fuel to the fire, aren't you? Like, still all mates though. He's like, why is he saying that? We're all triggered as fuck. <laughs> hey, I'll always remember. I'll always remember that Star Ladder event. The, the great battle Which one? between the Masters <laughs> and Alyssa. Ah. You Good mean one. the one, Yanko? This is this is another insight into Where the I world of casting. Of exactly. <laughs> one is so, this. so in a world in which me and Yanko, the analyst at the event, and Jason as well, because he was still the cast, uh, analyst at the time, even though we're doing every single game at the event, we're oh, totally worked to the this. max, right? We're not even allowed to make jokes that casters don't work hard enough. Because if we made jokes... Our fucking royal highnesses here were coming in like, I don't really appreciate it when you're making those jokes about me. I'm not working that hard. Like, I'm in <laughs> hey, 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 and we're all just sat there like triggered That was the similar voice. That was the similar voice. I know, that was on it. Get the fuck out of my face. That was the similar voice. There we go. Get the fuck out of my face. Don't even. Don't so even. <laughs> there we go. Like, dude, come the fuck on. Jesus Christ. Just that saying, was so yeah. that whole like debate was so stupid and was of such course. a waste of time, especially when you consider where those debates were held. Like, oh, we can't mention that, obviously. Yeah, Press it wasn't but, the setting to have a, an industry discussion within, have a miniature <laughs> podcast throughout it. You know, we're having like a nice dinner and everything, enjoying ourselves like to the fullest, and some people just want to talk shop and. That's not how you do it, you know, but yeah. yeah, I concur. Like, obviously, casters always have it easier than analysts. Yeah, so moving on to the next subject. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, though, Yanko, hey, you are right. All you they are have, right. The bad I thing is the they never had to I change anything. Thing. No, but all you had to do in that moment, Semler, wasn't... Your problem is you actually took the what we said and you addressed our points. What you should have done was just said, yeah, it is tough for you guys, but, you know, hopefully it gets better. And then everyone could have just chilled. Well, yeah, you should have just lied to us. You should have just told us the comforting lie that you were going to help fix it. Ah, oh, we'll fix it all for next event or whatever. But you start trying to debate us and we were at the end of our tether. I don't remember all, this at all. The end. All I know is... I don't remember this I, at all. What the fuck? We, really? had, these, was I... we had these... This, we had these discussions after like a day where me, Yanko, and Duncan had worked for like 17 hours from call time to like the end of the broadcast. Oh, well, the yeah. masters had come in and done like one best of three and been done. And Meanwhile, Sembla like, comes Please. in like, oh, the, the woman fucked up my hot stone massage. Oh, it's a little <laughs> bit too hot on my back there, actually. Someone get me a drink, will you? I've had a rough day. Anyway, how about you guys? <laughs> That sort of thing, you know. I was like, and yeah, Duncan is like eating be... eating cold pizza and warm Pepsi for like oh, the fourth time in this. The... Was the event we had the after party? We were all psyched to go to the after party, and on the grand finals, we yeah. were just like, "Listen, for the grand finals, can you guys just order us order us some sushi?" And, and Duncan is not too adventurous with the sushi. Oh, he just asked this, for like this some salmon, this was, oh, some no, salmon oh, no. nigiri, and of course, the salmon nigiri did not show up. It was the one only the only type of salmon that didn't come. All the other types of sushi in the world come, except Everything for salmonigiri, the one Duncan's thing I want. And I messaged Duncan on the way back to the hotel. He, like, disappeared before the rest of us. Like, hey, bro, you coming to the after party? Because, no, I'm just fucking pissed off. I'm done. I'm out. I'm, out. I'm not doing the after party. Yeah. Yeah. All over the salmonigiri. 
was that was the breaking point. I, was, I, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't he, handle he, it. He got yeah. right over the edge. Yeah, that was it. That was the end. That was that was my limit. I remember that Who was spicy. A, a small slice of fish could come between me and everything <laughs> I love. <laughs> <laughs> it's because that's an example, like Yanko said before, of like obviously the Geary itself wasn't the big deal. It's like everything else compounded. And in my brain, I was like, I will be getting this salmon again. And then when it didn't come, I was like, right, you know what? <laughs> I'm out of esports. See you guys. Yep. <laughs> and people were messaging me like, you're still coming to the party. Like, fuck you. No, no, don't message me. Oh, like, fuck. I went over the edge on that one. That was one of my limits. The thing is, though, if you notice the timing, I'm, that, I'm not exaggerating. That is literally the timing when I actually did start to cut down some of the events I did. Because mm, this is, yeah. maybe this is a good closing topic, actually. One thing that people won't realize is a reason why people have these like mad diva moments or breakdowns or start having fights with people who are actually friends of theirs is because in the old days when you did an event, yeah, you got wrecked and it was 14 hour days and all that, but it was like a weekend event. It was a two day event. And after that, you go back home, you take a day, you recover, and then you're back on with your life. And then the next event is in, you know, a month or in three weeks or, you know, you get, it gets so that you actually forget like how, how tough it can be in the moment. The problem is when the casting circuit got so that there was an event every two weeks of the year, and at the event, you work these long hours before we got like the schedules and stuff, you know. And then on top of it, you're surrounded by the same people all the time because we're all doing all the events. That's when, unfortunately, even if that guy's a guy you love, you're going to get to some point at one of these events where you hate that guy and you're like, fuck that guy and everything about <laughs> him. And oh, why is this? And it's just going to it's gonna set you off. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. No one, can, no one can escape that. It is. No, it is like. I mean, not to do the, the 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 trope or anything, but it is like being a family because you do get annoyed with your your brothers once in a while, and you do get into fights. And it was the same thing with us, where it was like, not only are we eating together, we're drinking together, we're socializing together, we're working together, and I they're the only like six hours you have off from each other is literally when you're sleeping. So you, you very get very little recharge time. I for me the breaking point has always been like this year I handled the the the, the schedule way better for whatever reason. But it's it's when the online leagues everything was fine with the online leagues you could do from your bedroom. Yeah. Once the online leagues started getting brought to studios and like I would have to be in Cologne for three months or Copenhagen for three months. And within those three months you're doing like three to four days of pro league and then you know you do. You do what Sunday to Wednesday, and then Thursday you fly out to an event, and then you're at an event for a week, and you get back, and the next day you start doing the online games, and you do that for three months solid. That's when you start to snap, yeah. like with the, with the no days off thing. Um, and I know Chad has like, I mean, Chad was crazy in 2018, where I think he said yes to everything that was offered to him, and I think even while also he, doing multiple long haul flights back to Australia for his yeah, days so, off, like and, and if know, anything, he tried to push that to the limit, didn't he? Yeah, and I know he had probably, I he had to have set the record this year of like the most consecutive days, you know, doing something. But I mean, if you oh, if no you doubt. imagine even back to like 2017, I think it was, there were like we had something like 500 some days of counter-strike content um throughout the year so i mean you're doing pro league i remember i remember in 2017 the, the first year that Sydney you mean 300 no no no. i mean like if you if you looked at all oh, the i think there was more than just up, even yeah. number of days right if, I see, if you, yes. if you okay. doubled up yeah but i know like when we did sydney the first year it was there we uh yankel i think you'll you sh you may know this um we we flew out to Sydney. We did the Sydney event, and we like it was like you did a broadcast. You flew out the day of the broadcast to Sydney. You had like maybe twelve hours off, and then rehearsal, and then like the six day event, and then you flew back. And the day we landed, we had to do a broadcast in the studio again. And like those are the kind of things that drive you nuts, is where there's no there's no break. And yeah, I mean you know you can you can say no, but like. You know, sometimes it it's just difficult work out because the way. people forget. People forget at the end of the day, we are all freelancers. Like no one is contracted to ESL. No one is contracted mm. to E League or DreamHack or Star Series. Whoever you blast, Epicenter. You know, I, I don't care, right? So, yes, you can pick your events. But as we touched on earlier, like, I mean, kind of hate to point it out, but you know, Samuel and Anders picked to. E League instead of Pro League at the time, um, and it looked great at the beginning, but then it turned out to not be what they expected. And you can see how they, to an extent, lost their spot to Matt and Henry, right? 
So that's a testament to, yeah, you can do less events, but if you're not doing these events, that means, well, someone else is going to have to be yes. doing them. And if that other person or that other pair, if you're talking about casters, proves to be capable enough, that means in the moment you want to come back, well, your spot is not going to be waiting for you. Someone's going to be having your spot, right? And even if you don't go that extreme, just as a matter of, you know, obviously Pro League, you could say, yeah, but Pro League is like five weeks, seven weeks, three weeks, whatever. You can skip some of them. Well, in theory, you could, but in reality, the organizer wants to have the same crew for every week, right? Because it's not only broadcasted on whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, it's also going on TV. So you kind of want to have that continuity or bring a storyline and having the same people on camera. So to an extent, it's almost a condition for you doing it, right? For really high profile people, you can say, hey, I want to skip this week here or this week there and you can get away with that. But you can't just come in and say, you know, you get like the days for Pro League and you say, yeah, I'll do this one week or these two sure. weeks. You know, you know, you need to kind of agree to doing the majority of it. And I think that how it how it is for everyone in the scene, for players, uh, the same it is for talent, right? Like there is oversaturation to an extent and, you know, you kind of want to keep up the grind, but it feels like everyone is to an extent looking forward to the moment where a couple or even if it's the one tournament organizer who's going to, re you know, come out as the main dog and, you know, the schedule is going to be set around this one organizer and we're going to have like a league and a couple of tournaments or something along those lines, and you you would know for sure if you're a if you're a talent or you're a player, <coughs> anyone who's involved with the scene, you would know. Okay, this is how the schedule looks for this year. Like Sabler knows now for Overwatch, right? Like you know when the league is happening, you know when the World Cups and the other tournaments are happening, and you know when the time of the year is where you don't have anything on your schedule. I think that's something that everyone who's been talent for uh, a couple of years now and everyone who's been a player for a couple of years now is something they would look very much forward to. Um, that being said, just to close it out, I do think that what we have in CS is great. Like the fact that we have so many TEOs, I think sure. it's the competitiveness, it push, pushes everyone to deliver a better product. Uh, and I think that's awesome. And I think it's going to be like this for a couple of years more. But I think eventually... Mm -hmm. It is going to come down to, okay, everyone's going to be tired of so much travel or so many different things. It's going to come down to two seasons of a league and a couple of tournaments. And I think that's fine a couple of years from now if we, if we end up at that point. I think that's the other side of the coin. Is the, the other part of wanting to do every single event is you're just saying, we know this is going to turn a corner, right? We know eventually this is all going to end and there's going to be like one primary organizer and if you if you take your foot off the gas you have a chance or you pick the wrong one you know yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, i love seeing that mustache curve up, you <laughs> sick fuck. um but yeah i i think that's that's a, that's a big part of it too is where it's just like we we know there's going to be a breaking point we know there's going to be you know someone who comes in with an actual exclusive offer that that is that is worth it and if if you're not you know visible in the space um, you're not going to be the one to receive that offer. So that's the other scary part, for me at least. Yeah, it's a, mm. obviously the exclusivity thing uh, sounds like what I'm talking about, but it's not as simple. Why would someone like Jason, for example, who every tournament organizer wants to hire him, why would he sign an exclusivity deal? Like, no one's going to pay him enough over the fee to justify him missing all the events <coughs> that he's not attending, right? So... That's why I mean, like, it's easy for people to say, oh, you're so burnt out. Why don't you just skip an event? But, you know, you're building relationships with these tournament organizers. And you're opening of course, a can of worms of, here. Uh, like no, no, wow. but of, of course, everyone can understand, like, an event here and there. But if you and it, if it ends up being a recurring thing, you know, your career is going to be in jeopardy. I forget which actual 
the who the player in question I'm talking about here, but I believe there is some famous story. Maybe Moses can uh, can verify this for me. It's a famous story in American culture. But you know the guy who had like the streak in baseball was that Lou Gehrig guy, right? I think that's who I'm talking about, right, Moses? The one who um, it was him or, or Cal Ripken, one yeah, of them, okay. like the guy who had the famous streak where he played like ten thousand games in a row, like a thousand or something, you know. And famously, I believe the story actually went that he only got into the first game of that streak because some guy like you know was injured or had to go out of the game and they popped this guy in as like the replacement and he then they went on to set like the streak of like a you know appearance streak it's, for like it's, a, Cal, it's Cal Ripken Jr. there we go yeah. so like that's just like 20, a it's it's given as like a classic example 100 consecutive or 2632 consecutive games over more than 16 years like, I, I'm not sure if I've got the, the details right, but it was someone like that. And the story oh. was basically, this is like an example of someone who got their opportunity and they just like ran with it. And obviously the joke there is, imagine if you're the guy who going out of that game, you're thinking, oh, I'm just going out of this one game and they're going to put my back up in. And it's like, wow. he just takes your spot forever. Well, it's one of the <laughs> most famous Shout things, out Drew right? Bledsoe. Yeah, Drew Bledsoe yeah, exactly. got swapped out twice, yeah. but it's also like Brett Favre, right? In the Packers, it's like sure. their starting quarterback got hurt, and then he turns on to have. That's why the Packers are so spoiled. Like they had Brett Favre, and then after that, they had Aaron Rodgers. So they had like two quarterbacks in the last twenty-five or more years, or something like that, and both are going to be Hall of Famers. So it's sure. just like, and that's why Brett Favre. He, I don't know if he has it still. I know he had it. Like he had the record for he had the most, most consecutive, consecutive games, I believe, yeah. most consecutive games started and a lot of those games were when he should have probably been ruled out but of course yeah he forced himself himself in because he knew how he got into the league right it was because the other guy got hurt and he had the selfish although you know justified attitude of well i don't want to give any other guy the chance sure. that i got i don't want anyone to come in instead of me and make people think, well, shit, maybe this guy is worth it like because he's cheaper or whatever. Maybe he's worth it like for this guy to be the starting quarterback and we can trade like the other like expensive guy somewhere else for a team that's, you know, needy or one. So mm. it definitely plays a role for sure. Because, you know, actually, along those lines, Moses, like that's actually the reason why <clears throat> people don't realize that when I, for example, argue for the open circuit, I'm actually arguing against my own interests. Like the best scenario for me, I can tell you from doing E-League when we did it on season two, because as I referenced, season two was less time. And I think we only did two days a week, if you remember. It was like Friday yeah. and Saturday or something. Yeah. And because we used to live in Atlanta in like a peer department and then go to E-League for these two days a week, it was kind of like the people who do LCS and Overwatch League now where you have your days off you're never traveling you're at home you just go to a venue I, I remember doing that and thinking th this would actually be a way better life for me personally like how sick would this be if you just lived in the spot you never had any yep. travel problems you didn't have to negotiate you know how many days of work you've got in a year you know what time off you've got you can tell someone three weeks from now yeah i'll be free on tuesday you don't have to look at what event is there and if you're gonna like the mad thing is, for me, selfishly, if I was one that was picked to be the analyst for such an exclusive league, it'd be way better. It's just that, like, for the games, I'd rather that it was an open circuit because I like having all the tournaments and the storyline. So it's actually a tough one in that scenario because one of the big upsides of Counter-Strike in terms of our scene wrecks us as, a, as talent, unfortunately. Whereas, in, as, you, as someone like Semler now knows, you can have a much more chill life when you've got all these, like, variables that aren't kind of moving like they are in CS, right? Yeah, That is one of the big positives. Yeah, I mean, I I'm of the opinion that I I love the open circuit, but I think we've we've gone to the open circuit extreme, which is I think we have too many events. You I, know I, what? I love an open circuit, but I know you don't follow a daughter that much. But I really feel like like I was one of these people who never would have been in favor of any form of like exclusivity. I didn't even want Valve to control it. But actually, after seeing what they did in Dota Two, I feel like that's where they should go with CS. Because the key thing is they still have loads of events in Dota. They have a really big circuit. It's just that Valve like sanctioned each of the events and was like, right, your event is a major. This one's a minor. This you know, and they made it so there's a, still a circuit like ours with like you know 10, 15 events in a year. But you know when the events are and you know who the organizer is and it's already announced at the beginning like I, if you could get some compromise like that so we i don't want to go the lcs route obviously but if you could get mm. something vaguely like that I, that's when it would for me be like the sweet spot it wouldn't it would that be, wouldn't that come back into um the whole argument with valve about you know not wanting to reproduce experiments sure you know that's that's that hasn't think, that been the issue i i think no i i think the open circuit is fine because we see the effects of people 
of teams skipping tournaments and, and so on and so on. Look at Star Series, right? The last Star Series tournament, not a single Tier 1 team was there, right? It was right after the Major. There was most teams. spots, but I think that, like, they were the yeah, only they, ones. They, yeah, they were the only team, yeah. So the, everyone else decided to skip it. So what happens? Next tournament, they announced in Shanghai, prize pool is increased significant, significantly. I think the prize pool is 500,000 yes. uh, yeah. for that tournament, right? And I know for a fact that they're offering teams like, you know, the flights they want and yeah. extra accommodation and so on and so on. So they, so what happened? Teams, okay, it's too many tournaments. We need to start skipping something. Let's keep Star Series, blah, 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 blah. Star Series, what do they do? They up the ante, right? Because they can, obviously, right? Like it's in within their means, otherwise they wouldn't do it. So some teams now that weren't attending the last tournament, they're committed to attending the next one. So that's the competition at its purest. It means sure. like, okay, so they're not going to come. We need to up the ante. We do it. Teams come. And that's what's happening with everyone. ESL, E-League, Blast, Star Series, Epicenter, DreamHack, right? They're all doing the same thing. But this cannot go on forever because at one point, teams are going to say no to, let's say, Star Series because we're talking about them as well. They're going to say, well, we cannot increase the prize pool. We cannot offer anything better that we're offering now. It's just the end of the road for us. And that's mm -hmm. it. Maybe, maybe, maybe that is someone else. Like, don't, don't take me literally. But, you know, that's the point. And at the end of the game, there's going to be one man left standing, one tournament organizer, right? So... I Unless think, they group I, together or something, you know, and make like a mini nah, circuit or something. Yeah, but I think, you know, I, I don't really think that's going to be, but whatever. Even if that happens, you never know. But the point is, it's like, that's why I think Counter-Strike is in a good moment. Yes, I agree that it's oversaturated, but it's oversaturated because of a good thing, because there's too many tournament organizers that all want to get in the game. They're all competing against each other. And I'm hoping 2019 will be the year where players smarten up and say, okay, we cannot keep going like this. We need to start picking. And when you start picking, it's obviously going to put some people out of business, like make some people stronger and so on and so on. And things are, and things are going to keep evolving. So I think we're slowly starting to get there in terms of players finally realizing we cannot just keep playing everything and playing every single tournament. You know, we saw it last year, maybe with Astralis, but more teams are starting to realize, okay, we need to start picking our fights and make sure that the tournaments we do decide to attend, we're 100% prepared for it. There was no better example than Mouseports last year. The only reason that team made a roster change was because of burnout. If they were smarter with picking their events, I think there would be no roster change. And even in the, we saw Robs and Sunny already in the top 20 players, you could see in their interviews and the things they said in that article that they felt like burnout was their biggest problem, that, you know, roster change was necessary. And I mean, in the end, when we look at it, they just came back to the player they benched. So mm -hmm. it's becoming a thing more and more, I feel like. Do you have any final, let's close this up then. So any, any final message from each person? Do you want to say something, Moses? Um, I mean, not, not, nothing particular. I just enjoyed this nostalgic trip. Love you boys. Love all the other guys we work all with. All still mates. So, That's what the episode yeah. will be called. <laughs> yeah, 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 there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, this is... Um, you, you, I thought yeah. about getting Henry and Sad on the episode as well, but I didn't want to trigger Yanko by talking about dropping the bomb again, so... <laughs> by the way that reminds me just as a quick shout because i didn't give that many stories See, at an event i wasn't at but just at home i was cackling away like a fucking like the, some, something out of a disney cartoon or something was when i saw that segment during the e-league boston major where they had yanko do the like us air force fucking segment <laughs> <laughs> Because even though I know, like, yeah, we all understand we're professionals, you know, this is fine, he can do that. Like, just knowing the whole context of Yanko's so life, like, I did enjoy that. I was laughing so hard when I saw that. Like, why have they done that? Which American producer hasn't thought this through? That's one of those funny but not funny things. Surreal, isn't it? I remember... I remember telling that cause I, I know I know Yanko and and we have a good enough relationship where I mean that's obviously a joke that he's made but um, it's still sensitive but I remember when I told E League about that I was like you guys should maybe you know think about 
reconsidering having Yanko do this segment. And I remember just watching producers' faces just turn fucking pale white. Like they were just like, holy shit, we had no idea. <laughs> yeah, but it's not it's not just okay. that. Like the guy the guy who's in charge of talent for me league, he came to me and he said, Hey, sorry, like you know, I'm so sorry, like we didn't think this through. Is this something that's bothering you? And like they, they did what they could to like help the situation, to be honest. Like it did bother me, but the problem was what am I supposed to say? Yeah, it's bothering me, have someone else do it, and they have like Anders or James or someone like that, like do tactical breakdowns like I mean, this sounds a little bit harsh, but there's a reason why casters are casters and analysts are analysts. And, you know, that's Unless you my... just, and then you just take everyone's fucking job. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Aside yeah, from yeah. that, but, but yeah. But that was I'm my, like, good, major, bitch. Like, that was, like, my, my major, like, first major with T-League, and I wanted, like, to deliver a good process. I was like, yeah, it's fine. The problem was, like, there was, like, a time when someone, like, made a joke about it, like, at a, a meeting at a production meeting that was like way out of line. So that was like, that was really like, okay, so people just think that this is a joke or something that they don't take it as seriously. And I really do take it seriously. Like, I know this is not like the show to talk about it, but I do joke about it, for example, with Jason or something, but you know, it's not something that you can take lightly, right? It's like a big thing that happened and you know, it, Whatever. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about politics here. Just the point of like, yeah, people can sometimes be inconsiderate. They can be insensitive, especially when it's like about people who are not close to them culturally, right? If that sure, makes yeah. any sense. So like, I got over it. Like, I was professional it, about it. I just wanted to deliver like uh, the best product I could. I just wanted to make the show as best as possible. It was no hard feelings about it. It was like fine, but it just showed to me how much people can not appreciate and how much they can be inconsiderate about something that happened to you just because you're on the other side of the world or maybe that's the part of the world that not re- that they are not really super concerned about or it's just something that they don't uh, encounter with on a day-to-day basis and that's it nothing special it wasn't it wasn't malicious and sensitive i guess yeah no it wasn't malicious no it was I, malicious I, I will say- it was just a bad joke it was just a bad joke and I, I do just, I mean, this is just to piggyback off Yanko, and it's a story about him is, is one of the things that was was probably one of the coolest stories you could have. I mean, we always talk about storylines around players, but one around an analyst. I remember, uh, Yanko, you know, I've had this discussion. Um, when, when Yanko got, I, I guess, snubbed would be a word you could use or just wasn't invited to the Atlanta major uh, that E-League did. I remember one of, you've told me this many times, one of your goals was to, um, work an e-league event and when they finally invited you to do an e-league event um, they told you right off the bat that you wouldn't be on the finals day which would be on TBS you wouldn't be on American television because they were still a little bit nervous about the accent and everything and you came into the event and just said uh, that your goal was to to prove them all wrong across five five six days and then work the, work the grand finals day and you did it which is which is an incredible uh, achievement, and I, I thought that was that was super cool that that you were not slated to work the grand finals day, and eventually they were just like we we have to have him on the desk. Like he's got the analysis, he's got personality, he's got knowledge, um, and that that was a super cool achievement from from your side of things. I think it was the Alderaan reference that really pushed me through, you know, to get that <laughs> final spot. No, but yeah, for sure, it was all cool. Like it was all fun games. Of course, you always want to set goals for yourself. You all guys know this. Like in your career, always set a goal for yourself. I want to do a major final. I want to work with every single tournament organizer. I want to do this. I want to do that. For me, in 2017, it was just like I haven't done something with E League. You know, they kind of skipped me in the yeah. in the stars. So for me, it was just like okay, they invited me now, and I could see through what they were talking about. Yeah, we just want you from the group. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna come there. I'm gonna show them that they need to they're going to invite me for the finals and then they're going to invite me for the major as well so that's and in the then end i'm going to take all their money <laughs> that's sure. what ends up happening so it's just like it was one of those feel good moments where it was like yeah i, I kind of knew i could pull this off so it was just about like getting the chance to do so got the chance i managed to pull it pull it off so yeah like it was all good it's always great working with those guys they're like so good at their job that it's like just going there and just uh, being an analyst it's so easy you know you have everything you 
you could wish for. Oh, of course. Like, that's one of those things, by the way, where, like, when people always try to come at me with the angle of, like, ah, you don't get hired for majors. It's like, I don't think you guys realize, like, I have done six majors. I was at six world championships of my favorite game for almost 20 years, like, as part of the talent. Like, I've won no matter what. Like, I could never do another major in my entire life, and what a sick career I've been able to have in casting. And Like, no one's promised to do six majors. That's fucking awesome. Think how many majors Majors in 1.6, all of them, by the way. I sat at home watching on camera or was at the event as a journalist. No part of the show whatsoever. You know, my memories are the same as any pleb on HLTV watching all the scenes. You know how different it is to mm-hmm. actually be on the talent crew, to be part of someone who made a great comment before a match or framed the narrative that you all remember afterwards. Like, you have to realize one of the great things about casting etc is even though in the moment you get mad at small things and you argue about this other aspect and oh I should have done this event why they hire that guy there's a part of you where if you do take stock you realize how fucking surreal the entire job is how sick it is and there are those moments where just something also happens and you're part of it and it's like there's there's no downside in that moment you know like it's just such a sick moment like you're just like this is perfect that's a good note to end it on and on that wholesome moment. Yeah, I, there we go. That's I good tried moment. to act that humble, sums it up. pretend it up. like I don't want to work more nicely. matches. That sums it up Similar nicely. never gave a goodbye message. Oh, I mean, Any goodbye message from you? I mean, thanks for having me on, mates. Glad that, uh, you know, we're still able to do this every now and again, despite the fact that I'm apparently a traitor or whatever we want to call me. To be Listen, honest, this let's is, all this go do some Overwatch cases. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I just want on an anecdote. I just want to say this. It's like, Samler, if you guys are ever looking for, you know, an analyst or something, <laughs> see, like, you have my number, you know. <laughs> this did not feel Jesus. This just felt like we were just like hopping off, hopping on a call to like catch up or something like that. Yeah, so it didn't really it didn't really feel like a show at all. So that's how you know it's been a good one. So no, and that's the thing. Yeah, if I people, had a, if I had people a enjoyed it. If people enjoyed it, if people enjoyed it and got this far, you know, glad uh, glad you guys, uh, you know managed to get a little bit of insight into uh, what happens behind the scenes. Right now, if you guys could all just remember to pay Paul Semler his fee uh, after the show, then we can all just uh, <laughs> we can all just wrap this up nice and neat in a bowl. So uh, I'll pay him in commodities. Yeah. Uh, a bottle of whiskey is going to do it, yeah. Okay. Just fine, you know which one. This video was kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Andreas Snazol Westerland, Gardner Wilson, Ollie J, Tobias Bernasconi, Nate D-O-double-G, James Harding, Kyla Harris, Travis Greb, Daniel Yordanov, Tristan Jones, and a special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for upcoming content of mine? Perhaps you'd like to ask me a question for my monthly video AMA. Do you want some teasers to see who the next guests are for my talk shows, for my interviews? Maybe you'd like to take part in a monthly esports discussion with yours truly. Well, put your money where your mouth is at the Patreon link in the description box below and join the Skrilluminati today.